কিছু দুঃসাহস দিয়ে গড়া জীবন পিছন থেকে উড়ে আসতে পারে মৃত্যু যখন তখন এই যুদ্ধে মাথা উঁচু করে বেঁচে থাকার লড়াইটা মার খেলে আরো জোরে দিতে হবে পাল্টা সময়ের আগে দিলে মোক্ষম চালটা নিশ্চিন্তেই হবে জয় আগুনের চেয়ে দ্রুত তোমাদের বিস্তার সাহসের সাথে আছে হাতে ধরা হাতি আর বিপদের হাত ছানি কেটে যায় বারবার তোমাদের কে সাহসের সাথে আছে হাতে ধরা হাতি আর বিপদের হাত ছানি কেটে যায় বারবার তোমাদের কে সেলাম তোমরাই আছো তাই নিশ্চিন্ত সবাই দেশ প্রেম তোমাদের সকলের জানা চাই শত্রুর চ্যালেঞ্জে জিতে ফের তোমরাই তোমাদের Hi guys, thank you for joining the live stream. I hope the audio is coming fine. Now, today's live stream is going to be very, very, uh, a little different and very uh, much, I think, eye-opening if it hasn't been, our live streams haven't been already. So uh, let me know if the audio is coming fine, by the way. I think it is. Yes. So uh, hi, Retroev. Hi, Ninar. Hi, Abhay. Hi, Milan. Uh, hi, Ninar. Uh, hi, Rishi. Hi, Tatvik. So guys, I can't. I can't explain in words the things I have found out today about the, let's say, lies, the absolute fucking lies that have been peddled by uh, by idiot, dumb, casty strads, communists, uh, and even well-meaning Hindutvadis, who all have bought into the, forever bought into the idea that uh, casteism and caste is distinctly Hindu or Indian, right? Now, we have already begun to debunk that horseshit absolutely. But today, Sumit Guha is very, very important because... This guy has a PhD from Cambridge, Cambridge University of all places, and is currently employed by the University of Texas in Austin. He's a professor of history there, and you won't believe the things he writes in the 40-page paper we are going to discuss. But before that, it's going to be a, a kind of a long live stream tonight. Luckily, the power didn't go off too much. The cyclone did not hit Bengal very hard, luckily. Now, uh, we are going to first start with this short interview of his from nine years back, okay, which he gave gave uh, on, on a sort of an interview hosted by the University of Texas themselves, okay. And the things he says are the exact things we say. Somehow, we are not taken seriously, nor is he taken seriously, nor is he, nor is, now in this case, his credentials don't even uh, get appreciated, nor is he in any significant academic position in India. Of course, India can't really afford to hire him, but at least he should have been 
requested to perhaps i don't think anyone even knows of him or knows of his work or probably the 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 idiot part of uh, sanghis don't even agree with him they think it never happened casteism never happened or it was invented by the british and stuff but you won't believe the stuff he says and the other different thing we are going to do today is when we are when we, we when we start his paper we are going to start with the conclusion first because how bombastic it is uh, i have two suggestions one is you all uh, st- have some notepad and stuff to take notes or on your laptop ipad something okay so that you can take note of the insane things he says okay a phd from cambridge and a prof- current professor of history at university of texas austin secondly my other suggestion is you all uh, get hold of the paper yourselves so that you you all can discuss it or or see it note it uh, along with it with me when i read it okay the paper is called civilizations markets and services cologne village servants in india from the 17th to the 20th century by dr sumit guha okay uh, this is a paper we'll we'll discuss he has another insane paper uh, which we will discuss tomorrow uh, or some some other day now uh, i haven't read the paper completely i've just read the abstract and conclusion and I'm, and i'm already blown away and then i have watched this interview you won't believe what you are in for you are absolutely in for a ride so prepare brace yourselves buckle up i've been of you haven't missed anything you are about to uh, get into the uh, insanity here first who is sumit guha now this is from a website called since left likes to appropriate everyone and anyone without really understanding sumit guha has a history in phd from ni- in 1981 from university of cambridge he is francis higginbotham noll centennial professor in history at the university of texas at austin his uh, previous books include environment and ethnicity in india circa 1200 to 1991 written in 1999 and health and population in south asia from earliest times to the present in 2001 and he has another book that he wrote in 2017 called uh, caste in india or something which i just ordered today only from amazon okay let's start the interview um welcome shimit thank you uh shimit teaches south asian history in the history department here at ut austin and he's just written a book that we're featuring this month called beyond caste identity and power in south asia let's start with the title yeah beyond caste identity and power in south asia now this is from 9 years back okay some people have said make sense to two years back uh now there's one guy who is already uh is sort of the i guess the ambedkarite uh, faction of uh, our society he's saying another expert brahmin scholar who is trying to justify caste etc and then in the comment section someone says okay so we need to believe whatever the imperialist british and european ideas about what foreign cultures are genius so there's somebody somebody already trolling him 3 years back before jay sai deepak uh, brings up sort of a counter to uh, the the caste conversation in in india this guy bharat 9889 okay he is already uh, angry with him 8 years back okay even though sumit goy is not brahmin to begin with he is a caste title um let's start with something that may be really obvious to you but isn't to everybody sure. south asia includes what is it um india or is it something more or less Why do we use South Asia these days instead of just talking about India? Right. Yes, that's something that um, many people uh, are unfamiliar with, and so I routinely get answer books which say Southeast Asia because that's <laughs> a term that many Americans are more familiar with. Mm-hmm. So South Asia uh, is a term which was devised by the State Department after World War II because you got a number of independent political um, states. in this area and if you just used india there would be confusion between the republic of india which control which occupies about 3/4 of the land area and the other states pakistan bangladesh nepal uh, myanmar or burma mm-hmm. sri lanka or ceylon and afghanistan and both myanmar is sometimes classed as part of southeast asia and sometimes as part of south asia and similarly afghanistan is sometimes thought of as being part of west asia and sometimes part of south asia so the boundary is a bit fuzzy mm-hmm. but the core of it is the what is known geographically as the indian subcontinent that's the re- mm-hmm. region south of the himalaya mountains and extending up to the oceans mm-hmm. in other directions the arabian sea the bay of bengal and the south indian ocean okay Now, the way he describes south asia already uh, brings to my mind that you can sort of flip the script with this term therefore you see that if he is talking about just like yesterday's paper right nicolas b dorks's paper caste and hierarchy in south asia he doesn't say india so it's already uh, these terms are going to be helpful to prove to debunk the myth that caste is indigenous to india okay so it's a south asian phenomenon at least to begin with it's not a distinctly hindu or indian phenomenon now let's see what he says 
Okay, good. Um, and then now let's turn to the, the other big word in your title, caste. Yes. I think um, it'll come as a surprise to many people that caste is not an indigenous South Asian term, but it's something that Europeans brought and uh, during the era of colonialism and for a name for what they found there. Um, well, where, where did, tell us a little bit more about where the term came from and when. Well, the really influential Europeans in the shaping of um, uh, of the kind of Western understanding of India and indeed of much of Asia were the Portuguese. <laughs> uh, and this is during, of course, the period of discoveries. 1498, Vasco da Gama arrives from Portugal uh, to India. And 1492, of course, Columbus, well, Columbus is the first European to discover the sea route to the Americas, let me qualify. <laughs> and um, so the Portuguese then go on to dominate Asian waters for a long time. And they import a word which is common to both Portuguese and Spanish, and that is casta. <laughs> and casta for them initially means a closed or a defined group, which, because at this point they're obsessed with the idea of purity of blood and uh, you know pure and impure descent, uh, this is the period when also they're preparing to expel the Jews from the Iberian Peninsula. So consequently, casta, which is actually just... See the way he frames it. You see, they were trying to expel the Jews anyway, and that's when they in, in, instead, of, instead come up with this term casta to, to describe the Indian society meaning a community of people with some sort of common descent is then very quickly racialized in the emerging oh. racial ideology. And the Dutch and the English, who to a great degree supplant the Portuguese, then take, take it as a, uh, enter, you know, borrow it as caste. Mm -hmm. Originally often spelled just C-A-S-T, but uh, then the English add C-A-S-T-E. How and he mentions this. He points it out, leaves it out there, moves on. Because... Uh, let's just read into uh, this a little more than there might in fact be. But he mentions this, that some for some reason, the British decided, let's add an E. It's not just caste, it's caste, T-E. So maybe that was one of the baby steps to make, to, to, uh, make it sound like it's distinctly Indian, to further indigenize it to India or Hinduism. However, it's one of those loan words that has now become entirely indigenized in India. And everybody, I mean, it's routinely used in most Indian languages. So let's talk about that process of it becoming indigenized mm -hmm. and go back before the Portuguese. What sort of um, uh, social or ethnic or hierarchical, I mean, uh, or, or political hierarchy existed that gave them the idea of naming it caste? Well, uh, this is a time when they're naming various kinds of, when they're creating and naming various kinds of racial groups across the world. Oh. Casta is, of course, a term which was there. In this <laughs> the question itself was pretty good to begin with. She, she says, how does it get mixed up with race and ethnicity and stuff? So he says, see, they were they were making up race, racial groups uh, and stuff. They were, they were let's say, whoa, whoa, imposed kar rahe the racial groups on different groups any, anyway. So, and then they thought, this is another racial group, maybe. Spanish Americas. In Mexico, by the 18th century, we begin getting albums of illustrations of different castas. You know, what happens when a, a sort of a person from Africa, usually imported as a slave, uh, has children by an Indian, Indio in that sense, mm -hmm. woman, etc., a white person and a black person, a, a white person and a Native American, and so on. And each of these would be called a casta. So the idea of having descent categories which are in, which are in some way closed is something that they have with them already. Uh, they also have, of course, this idea that you have pure and impure blood even among Christians. So <laughs> people of traceable Moorish or Jewish ancestry were uh, had impure blood. So that that comes with them. What they encounter in India are closed occupational groups, usually marrying amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. Occupational groups, usually marrying amongst themselves. And which are variously termed in different languages. India, South Asia has a whole number of languages. There are at least 14 or 15 major languages spoken by 30 or 40 million people at minimum. And uh, you also had Arabic and Persian terms for such closed groups. So it would be, I could make a very long list <laughs> of things that were called, uh, that the Portuguese render into caste. But um, the most common two would be qom or khum, which comes via the Arabic. And it nowadays means nation. And the second would be jati, which etymologically means actually the group of people that you know, but comes to mean a descent group. So there were a number of different ways of socially organizing people mm -hmm. when the Portuguese got there. Um, and, and, uh, ha and could you talk about those different groups for a little bit first? Sure. Uh, 
No, well, so, so there are a number of terms for such closed descent groups. Mm -hmm. But the idea of a descent group, which is at least in local society, ranked relative to others, which often pursues a given occupation, mm -hmm. was something that was extremely widespread. So what you get, uh, in fact, I've used the metaphor of a multi-stranded rope mm -hmm. in my book. So you get several strands. You get a strand which is occupational uh, or guild, a guild-like structure, except in this guild. Bhai, guild is ne nao saal pehle inho ne bol rakha hai. I found out that castes can be called guild from Dr. Koshik Gangopadha's book last year or this year only. Apprentices have to marry the daughters of other members of the guild. And that's partly how guild membership is defined. So it's occupational, it's marital. Sociologists have called it a marriage pool alliance. Mm -hmm. Marriage pool alliance. <laughs> Another name for caste. Marriage pool alliance. Sociologists have called it, not, not Hindutvadis. Which is to say a group of families which habitually marry each other's children. And remember uh, the fact that uh, it became uh, birth-based, uh, especially <clears throat> after the medieval era, during the medieval era, etc. How uh, Irfan Habib actually, in a way, let's say, justifies it. It would be, I think, fair to say that it meant job security, but no mobility, not horizontal, neither, uh, nor, nor vertical, okay? Not, not horizontal, not vertical, but at least job security. And everyone wants to uh, be in that profession. And it's guaranteed that your son will be in that profession and stuff. And um, finally, it's ranked in terms of honor and status, up and down a sort of social ladder. And um, it's also a taxation unit very often, because uh, like medieval guilds. Mm -hmm. Uh, horizontal mobility would be like uh, if you change your profession, but in a in a similar level of work with similar um, uh, salary and stuff. You know, if everybody, all the all the smiths or the carpenters form a caste, and he want and the king wants to levy a cess or a tax upon carpenters, or he wants to mobilize a certain number of them to come and build him a palace. Now, this is the important part we had also found out from Irfan Habib's uh, paper or lecture. That see, everyone benefited from it. In fact, I've used the metaphor of a multi-stranded role as defined. So it's occupational, it's marital. Sociologists have called it a marriage pool alliance, mm -hmm. which is to say a group of families which habitually marry each other's children. And um, finally, it's ranked in terms of honor and status up and down a sort of social ladder. And um, it's also a taxation unit very often. Because uh, like medieval guilds, mm -hmm. you know, if everybody, all the all the smiths or the carpenters form a caste and he want, and the king wants to levy a cess or a tax upon carpenters or he wants to mobilize a certain number of them to come and build him a palace, then he goes to the headman of the caste. So it, it fulfills. It's a closed group at which, to go back to the metaphor of a multi-stranded rope, mm -hmm. a number of economic, political, administrative and kinship strands all intertwine. And um, in your book, you point out that there are differences between Hindu communities and non-Hindu communities. How does that play into these different hierarchies and these different networks of groups? Well, any society where social groups interact regularly and intensively is going to work out ways in which they relate to each other. And this is particularly true in societies where the state is not very strong and self-help, uh, sometimes violent self-help, is the major way in which you resolve disputes. When it's a decentralized society, when the king is not a, not a crazy fucking dictator who, who says everything will be done by what I say in the palace in my capital, okay? The, the opposite of the Ashokan state. Uh, so... So therefore, uh, if you get a non-Muslim group of merchants, for, I'm sorry, a Muslim, let, let's say, or even a Christian, a Syrian Christian group of merchants who come and settle, they quickly, because they only marry amongst themselves and they tend to live in a segregated residential unit, they will quickly take on for all external purposes the characteristics of a caste. Mm -hmm. Internally, they don't have some of the ideologies and the religious beliefs associated with caste. But as far as the external relationships with the other groups in society are concerned, they are a caste. And when the British, for example, uh, begin to rule the city, the island of Bombay, which is 1665, they decide that they need to organize, uh, to recognize 15 castes 
One of these is Portuguese Christians. <laughs> One of them is Parsis, which are refugees from Iran who are not actually Hindus at all, but have a different, much older, the Zoroastrian faith, and so on. So that uh, you get all these uh, groups. And for the municipal government of Bombay, the company's government of Bombay, as you know, these are castes, and the government is going to deal with them as these are castes. And of course, they always marry amongst each other when there is no casteism. Uh, in any way, I guess, in the legally uh, speaking, at least way, although you could say reservation is, is a form of incentivizing casteism and etc. But Parsis even today are mostly endogamous. Syrian Christians are mostly endogamous even today. It's not like they were made to be segregated. They they came here running from from other people, both the Zoroastrians and the Syrian Christians. Actually, they came as Syrian Jews, as far as I know. Then then uh, Saint Thomas came and converted them into Christianity, and then they became Syrian Christians, right? As caste, they have headmen, they decide their own disputes, they give advice on property or marriage disputes. Uh, and, you know, why exactly they form a corporate group is not the king or the East India Company's concern. Mm -hmm. But it's easier for... No, no one is fighting against casteism, okay? Irfan Habib said Mughals never had a problem with casteism. They used it to their benefit. He is saying the Portuguese and the British also used casteism to their benefit because you help it, it helps you to uh, look at a society, analyze a society, collect data. Now, after listening to this interview, <clears throat> I'm getting the hunch that actually no politician in the country actually wants to annihilate caste completely. Maybe only only uh, BJP and Narendra Modi because they, they uh, put up a dominant uh, CM in every... Uh, a non-dominant uh, caste chief minister in every state where there is where uh, significant uh, cause playing and financial interest competition of previous castes but everyone else i think has found out the same same secret let's say ingredient to to running the country which cpm and congress did pretty overtly they, they never fucked with the dominant caste of every place but if you let casteism go on it helps you run the society earlier on Casteism was a result of the, the state not being too authoritarian. Now the authoritarian state uses casteism to its own benefit. For the king and the East India Company to uh, administer the whole uh, community when it's yes. organized in a way that they can yes. understand. Yes, absolutely. And also in which they can delegate. It's hard to find mm -hmm. out whether this weaver is a little richer or a little poorer than the next weaver when you want to levy a tax. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you assess the whole weaver community on a lump sum and you tell the headmen to distribute mm -hmm. the taxes amongst them and to come up with a certain sum to the treasury short of which he's going to get flogged or thrown in prison. <laughs> so it works. So, so if you for in the interest of being politically correct, I'm not laughing at the idea of anyone getting flogged. Okay, you could generalize. What are the major changes that took place after the British came in the 17th century? How does the caste system change? Well, initially it doesn't. Uh, yeah. It functions uh, just as it did, for example, under the Islamic um, sultans in parts, of, or as it did under the Dutch in uh, Sri Lanka. The Dutch organized the caste system in order to deliver cinnamon. Uh, both the actual people, there's a caste of people who become specialists in peeling the cinnamon uh, bark from the trees mm -hmm. and uh, various auxiliary castes that help with the production. But uh, essentially colonial rule, which is very slow in coming to South Asia, really Eastern India comes under British rule in the 1750s and 1760s when they've already been here for 150 years. Mm -hmm. And um, the rest of India really comes under British administration only by the mid 19th century, around 1849, say. So, and the East India Company's interest is running a profitable govern governing and trading operation. And they do not want to mess with local society any more than is necessary. Right. They were. They had no intention of solving the issue of uh, casteism. Now, <clears throat> uh, uh, as far as the uh, b the Bombay issue, Aju, um, I don't think any non non Marathi or non Maharashtra person who emigrated out of India before it uh, became Mumbai till date calls it Mumbai. Okay. Same as Calcutta and Kolkata. Okay. Uh, and. Uh, yeah, he used to be in Rutgers. Okay, uh, now he is in University of Austin. But when he was in Rutgers and Audrey Trushky was doing it, um, what do you expect him to do exactly? 
uh but anyway that's like saying um uh, uh any any non left musician has to uh, uh fight against all the leftists in the industry uh to and and prioritize that over everything else and so they find working through caste headmen dealing with disputes through them getting their advice on matters such as divorce inheritance quarrels over property etc it's just as administratively expedient and useful for them as it is as it was for previous rulers so they pretty much leave things unchanged they leave things unchanged it's only from the middle of the 19th century that some of the unintended consequences of british rule began to unravel the process and the action of christian missionaries unintended consequence of the british unravel the process not intended consequence they did not solve casteism okay plus there were countless anti caste movements inside hinduism already going on anyway but now he's going to point out something we had discussed based on mr sotrologist's uh, findings about i think about a year back that <clears throat> it was uh, he doesn't name brahmo samajis my hunch is he talks about brahmo samajis brahmo samajis who who peddled the aryan invasion theory further uh, and because they thought they are the distant relatives of uh, european christians because we all they all were aryans and stuff that gets also uh, that that also backfires okay he points that out as well who for centuries actually had also adapted to caste so that christians observed caste Oh, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Oh, they sat on different pews in the church. If they had a common church at all, the lower caste would often be given a separate church, to which the upper caste, well, the converts of the upper caste, would not go. And uh, they had headmen who organized affairs. They married only amongst the community. And in 1787, you have uh, after 150 years after the island of Goa, the British Portuguese colony there has been. a uh, converted to roman catholicism a caste of Bra- a group of brahmins there i mean they're roman catholics but they're brahmins that <laughs> also members junior members of the roman catholic clergy get together to stage a conspiracy to try and throw out the portuguese and establish the rule of christian brahmins yeah. uh, brahmins are the priestly caste mm-hmm. in um in in the indian subcontinent so you have christian brahmins who have preserved generations uh, traditions of their own ancestry for at least 150 years and claim to be brahmins and then they get together with other brahmins to try and oust the portuguese because they feel they're not getting an appropriate share of church office and authority i mean can you think of anything more ironic uh, yeah. and sort of complicated than that mm-hmm. actually uh, avinab yeah well pointed out but you see these are just cool dialogues right and okay after all politician cool dialogue nahi dega to kya dega wo sab koi thoda thodi baith ke research paper discuss karenge but these don't make sense there are many more castes today just like there were in the yester years but more importantly i should have mentioned this in my uh, yesterdays or when did i come last i i i am forgetting everything my sleep cycle is so fucking weird right now uh, so in my last live stream i forgot to mention that Uh, when we were discussing nicholas bidder's paper only right yeah and we were comparing it with today's bhadraloks who are today's brahmins uh, or brahmin like quasi brahmin brahmin adjacent and stuff you see that is why rajiv malhotra even though he is actually brahmin right malhotra i guess naam mein hotra hai to i think brahmin hi hoga but he is not really brahmin today in today's context in the true meaning of the word and that's why his research no actually basically rajiv malhotra has been saying the same things we are we have been saying in the last one or two years right that uh the the academia is being funded by people who are not really who probably don't really have the best interests of india at heart and therefore something must be done to tackle that rajiv malhotra is saying that we are saying exactly that but and he has brought his o- own research he has uh, written book after book after book held conferences after conferences tied up with people collaborated with people spent a, a shit ton of his own money in doing this he is not taken seriously at all in academia why because he is not a Br- brahmin in today's sense because he is a is a as an engineer who retired he does not have the credentials of liberal arts academia he is not a social scientist not is a liberal arts graduate or phd okay so he do- is not a true brahmin he does not have the proper janeu yeah it um your book m- makes it uh 
hard, it really resists the idea that caste is a simple ladder of, of hierarchies. And it shows a lot of different ways in which um, these corporate groups related to one another. Uh, you really emphasize um, uh, the political uses of caste mm -hmm. and uh, the ways in which caste then is used for the political powers to organize people beneath sure. them. Um, and you also emphasize something you call ethnicity. So in, in what way does caste organize itself um, ethnically? Right, that's a good um, question. Well, ethnos is, uh, of course, it enters the, it enters Western languages via rendering from the Hebrew goyim. Uh, the <laughs> peoples, as distinct from the chosen people. Mm -hmm. So the nations, it's sometimes rendered in the old, uh, in the authorized version. Mm -hmm. So ethnos is uh, a kind of, uh, in the Western categories, and for example, in Max Weber, it tends to have this idea of being a closed group, which within itself contains all the branches of the division of labor. Uh, that in fact was how 20th century thought tended to classify it. However, uh, since World War II, it's become fairly evident that it, such closed, entirely self-sufficient uh, groups, occupationally and um, otherwise self-sufficient groups are very rare. Most ethnic groups live mixed in with other groups. And when they do, they tend to develop stable patterns of relationship, very often relations of dominance or professional specialization. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, both the hierarchies of dominance and of business and economic professionalization, which I see in the caste system, caste can be thought of as being an exceptionally involuted or complex type of ethnic hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And there's a passage from Max and Max Weber's um, writings, which were translated by Gareth and Mills, where, in fact, he makes this argument. He says that um, uh, ethnic hierarchy, a stable ethnic hierarchy is, in fact, a caste hierarchy. Mm -hmm. So that's a concept of ethnicity that is very separate from race or from uh, where caste started as sort of blood purity. Um. Well, the Western idea of caste started, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> because in the Indic concept, uh, descent Indic purity concept. might be one of the criteria. Oh but for instance, my Brahman God. Way... He says he says three three insane things one after the other. Okay, first of all, the fourth uh, aspect would be, the first aspect would be that he quoted Max Weber. Then he says, the, the Western understanding of caste. Then he says, there's an Indic understanding of caste. And then he says this. The, the the purity impurity the manusmriti aspect of it is just one aspect pretty um well the western idea of caste started yes uh -huh. yeah because in the indic concept uh, descent purity might be one of the criteria but for instance a brahman weight beef let us say would be expelled from his caste and could perhaps never be readmitted he would be classed with the lowest castes mm -hmm. but, right hence hence it's not really hereditary because he has polluted himself you know irreparably mm -hmm. so you have this kind of uh, um, so you have, you know, so it's, it's actually, it's, it maintains several criteria for membership, mm -hmm. but ultimately membership was decided by the other members of the cast. Do we take this person back or do we kick him out for him or her or mm -hmm. uh, out forever? Mm -hmm. So, so essentially it's a very autonomous group, though sometimes you get people going and complaining to the king or later on to the Bombay high court saying that my caste has expelled me and is refusing to invite me to the religious feasts at the particular set days of the year and kindly issue an order saying that they have to take me back. Mm -hmm. And you get examples of such orders. You even get high court verdicts on these issues. So I, I asked about ethnicity because um, we tend to think of ethnicity as being racially defined or in some way connected with mm -hmm. race or nation. But what you're describing is much more um, social and occupationally oriented. Um, is, that, is, is there a racial element in caste or is that something that becomes part of caste over the centuries? Are Divya, we discussed an entire paper on that. It was Declan Quigley's paper, remember? Uh, well, you know, I'm covering a period um, of approximately a thousand years more for most of the book, but I go back about another thousand before that. <laughs> so, uh, and there are many, many centuries for which we know very little in mm -hmm. regions. So with that caveat, but, um, well, you know, race is a comparatively new idea mm -hmm. in Western thought, even where it originated. And um, as long as the biblical genealogies were held, you know, uh, to be absolutely true, you couldn't in fact have it. It was a great contortions that the idea that the sons of Ham were cursed to servitude was brought in by the slaveholding churches, uh, both in the Americas and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a uh, it's a new concept even in Western thought, and where it originated, and it is hard to. It was sort of borrowed in the 20th century, as a part of the Nordic or Aryan myth of descent. 
And what you get is some of the upper castes in India latching onto this Western theory to claim that they are of Aryan descent, whereas the lower castes are not. <laughs> and consequently, uh, they belong to the to the superior Aryan race, to which, of course, Europeans, of which Europeans were the uh, acme. And um, so it's, uh, so race does come in as a modern ideology, but um, it has, in fact, caste has become increasingly, um, and this is a term which was used by Louis Dumont, the French uh, anthropologist. Okay, <laughs> our favorite sociologist, Dumont. It has become ethnic. Anand, Anand, bro, please, please watch this from the beginning. Or at least watch the interview on your own from the beginning some for some other time in which it has stopped being about conduct and purity and has become descent, uh, uh, sort of descent group. And in that sense, it's close to caste, I'm sorry, it's close to race and to ethnicity. Well, you tell a, a wonderfully complex story about something that I think most people assume is a relatively simple hierarchy. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome. So, uh, um, Anand, you need to especially listen to this from the very beginning because remember when you had uh, joined our stream on a, on an audience interaction day, we were discussing how castes are basically guilds. He uses that word as well. This video is from nine years back. Okay, he says it's a guild or it's a marriage alliance pool. He uses all these terms. Now let's get to the paper. What do you hear, Rutgers? Me. Uh, how is he Rutger in Rutgers? He's in Austin, Texas. So was he in? Was he in Rutgers or is Rutgers a think tank? I don't know what exactly Rutgers is. Is it a university? It's in university, right? So it's he's not in Rutgers anymore, right? Okay, let's start the insane paper of which we will first start with the conclusion because it, that's it's that uh, um, I mean uh, mind blowing, mind boggling. So let me put this uh, monitor here. Yeah, check out the. Check out the conclusion first. Okay. <clears throat> Rutgers is, is where Trushki is from. Yes, but uh, why are people saying he is in uh, Rutgers? Maybe he was at some point in, uh, in, in Rutgers. He's a fucking Cambridge PhD. Why wouldn't he be at Rutgers? He will be all, at all elite universities. India ke elite university mein isko bithane se kaun kisko mana kar rahe bhai? Wohi to mera aaj ka main main prashan hai. Why isn't this guy in any Indian university? Why isn't Declan Quigley in any Indian university? Why isn't Nicholas Dirks in an Indian university? Why isn't Janki Bakhle teaching in un Indian universities that uh, Savarkar had nothing to do with being a mafia veer? So the conclusion of uh, the paper we are going to discuss today. There are three sentences. The first sentence and the last sentence is absolutely insane. The tone is insane. It will be evident that I am deeply skeptical of attempts to trace socio-economic institutions to fundamental values. Okay. Fundamental values ke saath deep socio-economic uh, institutions hum jod nahi sakte hain. And that I have found considerable ev evidence to suggest that individuals systematically sought to, sought to modify and invent customs and institutions to their own perceived advantage. And that the patrimonial, meaning caste system, birthways caste system, and the latter, uh, the, the later colonial state, both of these systems tried to derive fiscal, meaning financial and political advantage from these efforts. Okay. In the end, it was political and financial economic advantage. Okay. Hence, you see what's happening today in today's Indian politics is nothing different. The occurrence is same. And even if the occurrence remains same, we can flip the script playing in these sets of rules. You can't probably really do anything more than that other than, of course, virtue signaling. But more importantly, this reminds me of the day we were discussing, the last day of discussing Max Weber's uh, book, Religions of India, that uh, Brahmins made their own rituals when an inconvenience came about with that ritual, following the ritual or executing that ritual. They made backdoors, backdoor rituals to that previous ritual as well. Okay. Now, Second sentence, the varying outcomes of these ceaseless contests explains why institutions varied considerably at different times and in different regions. Yehi to hai hamar argument. Now the bombastic third line, the last line of the paper. Society was never static in some quote-unquote traditional mode and social change is not something that arrived in South Asia with colonial rule or the fi first five-year plan. Can you believe this sentence, guys? Are you all understanding 
what the insane significance of this sentence is. It busts every fucking myth that that 99% of Indians believe in. Society was never static in some traditional mode. Social change is not something that arrived in South Asia with colonial rule or the first five-year plan. Lol. <sighs> Let's start the paper now. We are going to discuss the Jajmani system. Yeah, so you see, Jafra Lo is in India teaching. Trashke used to teach in India for a while. Now, uh, this guy, Aju is saying he was in Rutgers in 2004, when most of us weren't on, the, on this side anyway. So why are we blaming him? Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to read out Nina's comment here, because I'm trying to be politically correct a little bit. So... Uh, civilizations, markets, and services. Village servants in India from the 17th to the 20th century, Sumit Guha, when he was in Brown University, another elite Ivy League university. So the abstract of the university uh, of the paper is that this article focuses on the history of the set of practices labeled Jajmani. These practices have been cited as evidence that a fundamentally inegalitarian spiritual principle could transcend and limit the economic domain, okay? The all-encompassing deep state Brahmins, okay? The idea underpins the belief that human beings must be grouped into mutually exclusive quote unquote civilizations projected geopolitically. The quote unquote civilization is then endowed by Samuel Huntington with the Hobbesian self aggrandizing traits of the national uh, nation state. Okay. I suggest that we eschew grand unifying principles and try understand the meanings and motives that generate to the repetitive patterns of meaningful interaction, which we refer to as a society, a social practice, or an institution. This paper offers a historical analysis of the debate stemming from opposed understandings of a South Asian socio-economic institution and of its social history through the past few centuries. It focuses specifically on the economically, socially, and ritually significant practices grouped under the label of Jajmani and or uh, Baluta system. These have been presented as exemplars of how productive activity can be organized on non-economic principles, untouched by individualism and market rationality and determined by the fundamentally religious values of uh, Hindu society, all of which are wrong, obviously. He's making, a fun of, uh, making fun of these uh, ideas that uh, as if the Jajmani system had non-economic principles or were untouched by individualism or did not have any market rationality uh, behind them, okay? And they were fundamentally religious values of Hindu, Hindu society. The missionary anthropologist, missionary anthropologist, <laughs> is, he, is he doing this on purpose? Or is this coming across as trolling only to us? So the missionary anthropologist, W.H. Weiser, is usually credited with the earliest formal statement on these lines. Okay, guys, he points out a missionary anthropologist was the first one who pointed out that uh, the Jajmani system is an entirely religious system that people follow after reading a few pages of Manusmriti every morning, I guess. The missionary anthropologist W.H. Weiser is usually credited with the earliest formal statement on these lines. And remember, these were the days of anthropology when anthropology was mired in uh, wo, eugenicism and stuff and all sorts of genocidal maniacal concepts that came out of anthropology. These were the days of that kind of anthropology, by the way. A year after the second edition had appeared in 1958, the entire religious formulation was sharply criticized by Thomas Beidelman, who argued that the system was maintained only by the exercise of the socio-economic power that arose from landholding. As we shall see below, the influential Louis Dumont, Dumont, perhaps heedful of this critique, Therefore, Dumont did not use Weiser's description as evidence of the equalizing roles of religious incorporation, okay? So, Dumont already realize, realizes that ye, ye, um, uh, wo matlab, uh, missionary anthropologists ko to gali par rahi hai. I'll, I'll explain it in, with, in some other way, but say the same thing. Instead, Dumont cited Jajmani as evidence that a fundamentally inegalitarian spiritual principle could transcend and limit not merely the political but also the economic domain. This is an issue with implications beyond the narrow worlds of Indology or social anthropology. While I do not intend to address this in the present essay, the heuristic assumption that human beings must be grouped into large, temporally stable and mutually exclusive civilizations is central to the thought of Dumo and his ilk. 
this guiding principle once admitted scholarly effort then logically seeks to identify the unifying demarcating principle of each civilization and as the unique nation national spirit so popular in the 19th century fell out of fashion after world war 1 the seemingly more benign but still mutually incommunicable civilizational or cultural identity acquired a new prominence in the academy meaning inside academia projected geopolitically the quote unquote civilization is then endowed with the hobbesian not i said hobbesian oh my god uh, then endowed with the hobbesian self aggrandizing traits of the erstwhile nation and this model found its popularizer in 1996 with the runaway success of huntington's clash of civilizations returning to dumo on jajmani it being it becomes evident that the effort to determine whether the economic or political or any other mental construct <laughs> any other mental construct encompasses or controls arises fundamentally from the drive to find a unifying civilizational principle so that the outsider is of course the one who is trying to do this he find he he is able to define india or any country in any society in in one way in one sentence or in one term wohi hai wo wo chah jiske wajah se ye thought process shuru hota hai economic success being permanently reserved for the west something else had to be found for india and what better candidate than hinduism broadly construed see this is exactly the brilliant critique actually that even amartya sen brings out that acha economic understanding hard sciences research वो सब वेस्ट का है हमारा हम तो है स्पिरिचुअली में स्पिरिचुअलिटी में बेटर एंड पीपल कंसीड दैट पॉइंट एंड सेलिब्रेट दैट पॉइंट एंड गिव अवे द द द आवर आवर पास्ट ब्रिलियंस एंड इन मैथमेटिक्स एंड हार्ट साइंसेस साउथ एशियन सोसाइटी देन लेट टू बी एम्प्यूटेटेड टू फिट द प्रोक्रिस्टियन बेड दैट दस फैशन ओके साउथ एशियन सोसाइटी बिकम्स एम्प्यूटेटेड टू फिट इन टू द प्रोक्रिस्टियन बेड दैट बेड दैट दस फैशन 12 centuries of islam counted for nothing it is in short a question of two societies hindu this is from i guess huntington's book it is in short a question of two societies hinduism and islam which were strangers to one another in virtue of the opposition of their values although living cheek by jaw jaw in fact their association resting on a sort of tacit and reciprocal compromise for their part the hindus had to adjust adjust themselves for long periods and over huge regions to political masters who did not recognize brahmanic values and they did not treat even the most humble muslim villagers as untouchables <clears throat> this sweeping statement can only uh, can only be made if we understand society so as to exclude many of the transactions that people routinely have with each other from the ambit of this term because once you buy into this idea that uh, some things are distinctly indian and stuff uh, and and india is all about spirituality and spirituality and religion only then after that you can use any any excuse to justify it and come up with confirm bi- confirmation bias and and mention one uh, one one insane thing after the other and blame it all on the society and the culture and religion of that place ignoring therefore the inevitable socio economic circum- circumstances that give birth to those situations elsewhere as well but you have come up with a different name for this and and uh, caste strats and commies are both happy with with crediting or discredit or crediting india with this evil slash great thing such a formulation is an obstacle rather than an aid to understanding perhaps what we need to do is eschew grand unifying principles and try understand the meanings and motives that generate to the repetitive patterns of meaningful interaction that we refer to as a society or a social practice or institution nor should we anachronistically force these into boxes labeled economic social political religious etc i shall now try and demonstrate this by a study of the links between the state ascriptive status meaning caste Ninar, where are you? M Shastri, Bhupendra, Avinav, Divya, see, he directly, blatantly, calmly, casually uses a completely different phrase for caste and puts caste in fucking brackets. Ascriptive status, <laughs> joy, Baba, Max Weber, okay, see, RSS ka dalal Max Weber has had such influence influence on this guy. I shall now try and demonstrate this by a study of the links between the state ascriptive status and economic life in western india through the past 3 centuries the first section <laughs> the first section of this article discusses the varying positions uh, taken by major scholars on the issue before moving to historical analysis analysis 
of two related institutions, Baluta and Jajmani. Baluta is used to describe a system in which specified goods and services were provided by hereditary functionaries to theoretically all the households in a given village, uh, village community in return for equally specific payments in kind, sometimes supplemented with cash at the harvest and on festive occasions. Seems like a uh, job, job security to me. Jajmani has entered sociological literature to describe the relationship between a patron household and individual servant households and that supplied it and others like it with goods or services in return for payments at harvest and on other occasions. While some scholars have seen these as distinct from each other, others like Dumo have treated them as expressions of a single civilizational principle. I shall, however, use these terms as defined in this paragraph. The next part looks at evidences of the geographical spread and economic logic of the Jajmani system in the 20th century and suggests and suggests that and suggests that uh, rent seeking and the market were important determinants of its changing structure and regional parlance. This section is followed by one offering a historical analysis of Baluta in Maharashtra from the 17th century onward. It suggests that the practice was always fraught with conflict and provides evidence of its occasional breakdown and re-establishment. So, we were Manusmriti Parke ye sab kar rahe the, to breakdown ka hai hua, re-establishment kaise hua. It would follow then that the system may have repeatedly come into being and disintegrated in different regions at various times. Doesn't this sound familiar, okay? Different regions in different times, guys. The last part of the paper shows this process at work. The institution was little known in Eastern Maharashtra and Chhattisgarh in the early 19th century when it was solidly established in Western Maharashtra. But intensive local enquiries reveal that it was beginning to establish itself in the eastern region. After reviewing this case, the paper moves to, a, to conclude that Baluta was not a primitive institution, but one that was created by the state out of competition between specialists in a commercializing rural society. Specialists. Specialist kaise hua wo? Uh, Nina, he won't cite Declan Quigley. He's much more senior than Quigley actually. Quigley is uh, uh, Quigley is hardly in his late forties. He has written these papers so long back. After reviewing this case, the paper moves to conclude uh, that Baluta was not a primitive institution, but one that was created by the state out of competition between specialists in a commercializing rural society. Okay, this sounds like today's socialist state as well. Finally, I, am, I must emphasize that this society was not composed of socially indistinguishable agents, each of whom was devoid of tastes, preferences, and socio-religious ideas. So, they had, the society was comprised of agents who did have tastes, preferences, and different socio-religious ideas. <laughs> Moving beyond economic versus cultural explanations, okay? Let's go beyond this. Actually, I will have to, this beyond say, yaad aya. the book is called Beyond Cast. He's talking about be, going beyond economic versus cultural, uh, either economic or cultural sort of explanations. I will read out to you two paragraphs out of this legendary book, Beyond Good and Evil by Nietzsche. And that will be sort of a conclusion to our live stream today that what are the caste strats and commies getting wrong about Indian society and how we are now taking a different path and uh, how our worldview is actually uh, more Nietzschean in a way. The village servant system or Baluta system to use its Marathi name and the Jajmani system have attained a certain importance in social theory because they appear to exemplify the possibility of organizing the division of labor in complex societies on principles radically different from those formulated by mainstream economics since the 18th century. Up to 18th century ke baad jo Theoreticization on, on past institutions. It is for this reason significant in the substantivist formalist debate in economic anthropology inaugurated by Polanyi in the 1940s. But as I have suggested in the introduction to this article, this debate has prevented us from examining a changing set of institutional practices on its own terms and thus impeded rather than aided a historical understanding of it. And this impeded section is, I think, very important because what do we notice, guys, by, by everyone trying to solve casteism in India, that they don't fucking solve casteism, that they uh, they just uh, incentivize casteism or just glorify one group over the other or just stick to signaling that they are against casteism 
or some people just stick to signaling that they are against brahmins so this is this is a problem here that these discourses have impeded rather than aided a historical understanding of it aur jab tum samjhoge hi nahi cheez ko theek se to tum solve kaise karoge wo problem ko like again uh, wo riktik ghatok's quote yesterday that i pointed out from juktakko gappo kono kichu nahi bolle chole jabe na take joriye dhore upre felte hobe you have to hug that problem and and pull it out of the ground this was noted uh, by cj fuller some years ago on the basis of a legendary sociology i think is called father of sociology um what do you define as uh, caste is trad one who follows traditions but also hates anyone who is below their caste today on the basis of a review of about a dozen 20th century 20th century village studies and some secondary historical literature he correctly concluded that the concept of jajmani as a system is predicated upon a combination of historical inaccuracy and the ahistorical premise of unchanging traditional so called uh, quote unquote traditional india he then suggests that we were only following traditions by hamara arthashastra fastra economic us nahi tha sirf subah se sham hum puja karte the aur sochte the ke tradition ke basis pe kya kya matlab theek hai galat hai hamara incentive structure naam ka koi cheez nahi tha personal interest nahi tha convenience nahi tha harami panti nahi tha kuch nahi tha sirf tradition tha he then suggests that his demolition might open the way to a more productive analysis of forms of exchange in indian society this article aims at advancing that agenda i think it's our agenda as well but the debate is also significant as it forms in the work of dumo a central support of the ideas that south asia in or hindu civilization <laughs> oh shit Uh, but the debate is also significant as it forms in the work of dumo a central support of the idea that south asian or hindu civilization is founded on principles totally different from those of the west and that the caste quote unquote system is fundamental to it according to dumo he is making a fun of all that first of all he is equating the term hindu civilization with south asian civilization and then saying people like dumo believe that as if our our way of life i mean our principles of organization is completely different from the west or that the the caste system he says quote unquote system because remember it's actually not a system there's no system it's a fucking chaos that was kind of systematized and therefore rigidified and solidified by the british so that the caste so called system is as if it's fundamental to it which it isn't but caste strads and commies will disagree more recently modern class reinstated caste theoretically as the economic center of south asian society he was satisfied that one may view the south asian caste system as a crucial integrative feature of a, a particular redistributive economic system <laughs> redistributive economic system this is a stratified society not everyone has equal or even equivalent access to the basic resource land on which to grow a crop and in this particular stratified society we have observed that control and access is neither by individuals nor by households rather the south asian socio economic system is structurally inseparable from the caste system in this he was echoing the work of w c neel who had already declared that the economy of india was built upon the joint family which was generally able to satisfy its own needs when the aid of a craftsman or a special service such as that of a watchman was required the village provided it cutting across village lines the castes provided a code of behavior governing the relationships between members of the various castes so perfect was the ideological integration that neel imagined there was quote unquote no bargaining no payment for specific services rendered there was no accounting and the whole produce was easily and successfully divided among the villages now obviously sumit guha's point is trying to hint that he's wrong contrast this to the reality of a north indian village around 1950 as described in the memoir of a dalit youth who grew up in it he narrates an incident deeply revealing of the actual texture of jajmani relations his mother worked for eight or 10 tyagi households one of these was celebrating a daughter's wedding and his mother waited with him and his young sister to clear up and take away the basket in which the guests threw their used leaf plates and uneaten food these scraps were her remuneration for the extra work when all the guests had left she asked for a leaf cup of a uh, leaf cup of food for her children quote sukhdev singh pointed pointed to the basket full of soiled leaf plates and said she is taking a, ba- a full basket of food refuse jutan and on top of that asks food for her children mind your status oh churi pick up the basket and get out mind your status see everyone inherently 
knows that castes are basically status groups and therefore when we point it when we point this uh, this discourse towards bengal it's going to be a sort of a field day of revelations so mind your status oh chori i guess okat mero that's what he said pick up the basket and get out that day the goddess durga descended into my mother i had never seen her thus before she scattered the contents of the basket and said to sukhdev singh gather this and store it in your house feed it to your guests for breakfast holy shit she took our hands and left swift as an arrow sukhdev singh had stepped forward to strike her but she faced him down like a tigress from that day she never went to their door again and the custom of collecting soil scraps ended in our household and <clears throat> economic and political weakness and social inferiority continued seamlessly into labor market settings another quote most tagas upper caste landowners claiming brahman status stinted on wages for their employees the reapers were desperate after some protests they took whatever was given and came home upon getting home they grumbled or kept cursing the tagas but protest was strangled by hunger each year there were meetings in the dalit quarter of over harvest wages participants would swear not to accept less than one bundle of uh, one bundle out of 16 harvested but once the work was done their resolve evaporated one bundle out of 21 was the best that could be got which is why wbc's officers of west bengal are happy with the uh, with the with the joke of a da that they get uh, because they of course oppose the central government which gives much more da neil's ideas of harmonious reciprocity are a less uh, are, are a less developed form of dumo's famous understanding of south asian civilization over the past few millennia as being constructed on the foundation of a normative inequality something radically different from the allegedly western norm of equality in his view these relations of service were the most deeply resistant to the modernizing impact of the west in the revised edition of homo hierarchicus that that famous in famous book okay in the revised edition of homo hierarchicus he concludes dumo concludes in the caste system profession is linked to status only by its religious aspects and for the rest hinges on power it has been possible for new neutral and urban professions to emerge while the professions really relevant to the system village specialties were only slightly affect- affected at most it is likely that jajmani has become restricted to properly religious and personal services and has let escape some professions which it covered pr- previously in the caste system the political socio uh, political economic aspects are relatively secondary and isolated according to dumo we may in passing notice that this assumes right away that the quote unquote caste system is something quite distinct from the political quote unquote political economic and that a profession easily separates into uh, separates into religious on one side and power related aspects on the other side as if <laughs> in indian society these as i shall demonstrate are profoundly ill informed ideas and given the publication of fukuzawa's important essay in english in 1972 perhaps deliberately so in part this arises from a truly archaic understanding of concrete market phenomena dumo believes that quote in a market all buyers and all sellers are as such identical each after his own profit and needs are adjusted unconsciously by the market mechanism but this is not the case here in the indian village not only are the majority of the relationships personal but this is so in virtue of an organization which is to some extent deliberate and oriented towards the th- satisfaction of the needs of all those who enter into the system of relationships will directly religio- religious pr- prestations and quote unquote economic prestations are mingled together this takes place within the prescribed order the religious order we shall feel in the end that we are not in the world of modern economic individual but in a sort of cooperative where the main aim is to ensure the subsistence of everybody everyone in accordance with his social function in the one case the reference is to the individual pursuing his own gain in the other to the hierarchical collectivity the conclusion to be drawn from this for the jajmani system is that it eludes what we call economics okay so according to dumo jajmani system has nothing to do with economics because it is founded on an implicit reference to the whole which in its nature is religious or if one prefers a matter of ultimate values <sighs> end quote the above quotation assumes that markets can only function by erasing all identities in the marketplace in fact it is only under special conditions that buyers and sellers can really become anonymous and indistinguishable as anybody and especially a white anthropologist who has shopped in a bazaar should know buyers and sellers can find it advantageous to try and negotiate 
the best possible terms on a case by case basis drawing information from signs of visible social status including appearance speech dress etc to assess the other party for example today if a uh, no matter how famous a singer if he is called by air rahman to sing uh, in his concerts if air rahman says that i'll i'll pay you a little less than what you usually charge because air rahman of course is not going to make him sing for two and a half hours right uh, plus there will be other singers and stuff uh, but more importantly the singer agrees and the singer might not have agreed for the same amount of singing that he would have to do in some other places because singing with air rahman is a big fucking deal in itself and that's the same for even the beginner equally if buyers are not homogeneous neither are commodities services etc a vendor who sold at a uniform price could benefit from the ignorance of some consumers right uniform prices for homogeneous products emerge in mass markets supplied by machine production markets where learning about the other party is costly either in direct money or either in direct money terms for example by a credit report or in terms of opportunity costs for example losing sales while getting this information via bargaining or special or or personal inquiry enquiry so the early industrial revolution and the modern city encouraged the emergence of mass markets where standardized goods were sold to a mass of indistinguishable buyers but efforts at discriminatory pricing immediately reemerged when the individual transaction increases in size or when the cost of information when the cost of information acquisition and processing falls jaise ki hai today's data industry you are putting up your own data in every app and ott and and uh, etc or social media platforms such individualized bargaining is almost routine in trade in big ticket items for example ships passenger or combat aircraft or turnkey industrial plants where a few agents with a lot of knowledge of each other in- interact finally as modern information technology reduces the cost of acquiring and processing information even vendors of mass market consumer goods in developed countries particularly the usa try and build up consumer preference databases and profiles exactly what i just said the simple anonymity and uh, the the so called no information except price available is a model that dominated western consumer goods markets after the industrial revolution and up to the current infotech revolution which has substantially eroded it it should not be expected to shed much light on economic relations in typical south asian rural situation of repeated interactions between a small number of transactors with a great deal of time on their hands let me have a sip of coffee and check out some comments now <sighs> what's going on in the comment section <clears throat> you are discussing uh, theology <laughs> Atishwar is saying, "Only who did not understand the real spiritual side, uh, uh, Vivek of Swami Vivekananda, will quote Swami Ji on this. We are spiritual, and West is scientific. Uh, but uh, okay, uh, yeah, maybe maybe I am understanding it wrong, and uh, Amar Tushan is under understanding it wrong. But people who agree with this, they are also the ones who understood it wrong and decided that meditation is the best we can provide to the world." i feel the uh, so casteism was both libertarian and socialist in weird ways <laughs> horse fucking shoe uh no i'm merely saying one is brahmin lineage one be a casteist caste caste would be if you are misbehaving yes yes absolutely uh only understanding of varna system in society can solve uh caste system uh yeah by understanding uh, what do you mean uske upar bhi depend karta hai because um Uh, we are understanding it and it seems like just a bunch of status group stuff that is inevitable and bad behavior uh, on based on that is also inevitable so we need repeated disruptions uh, one disruption is of course uh, economic economics and the other disruption is uh, hindu unity and stuff i think the market forces do have an in- impact in decreasing uh, casteism yes kushal mehra is very dumonshi yes uh, no hindu scripture elevates any caste to the highest and for a caste and for a casteist is one who self elevates themselves and refuses to accept the interoperability of the four varnas mm, well 
the scriptures that say that there will be a nice life for him and not nice life you have to behave badly towards them etc uh societal failure yeah but also inevitable uh, human flaws this sounds like a workers union <laughs> um like leviticus says mixing colors if a, is a sin if a sin is a sin that requires death do you see christians following this <laughs> yeah incentives is everything ultimately uh away saying this is why need decoloniality to some extent and the the way we are approaching this is a decolonial decolonial uh, step i don't think academics are blaming vivekananda for claiming east stone <laughs> spirituality yes i'm taking notes i have to rewatch it many times and have to take more notes these papers are weapons to fight yes everyone else was silent about the west claiming science is theirs don't think varna is relevant anymore again we need guru student or yeah yeah varna is not relevant for example british uh, calls 1857 a mutiny savarkar challenged it and called it a war of independence so did karl marx as far as i know uh one brahmin student from tamil nadu had filed the case even after being overly qualified congress government in tamil nadu central were in huge trouble even losing judicial battle against zamindars in bihar okay uh let's let's resume the paper now <clears throat> so in fact discriminatory practices uh discriminatory pricing based on social or other distinction is advantageous if it allows one participant to appropriate some or all of the consumer surplus resulting from the transaction ac pigu in 1920 had already considered how discriminatory pricing might operate if agents could be grouped into sets distinguished by some practicable mark and this always happens people do negotiate some in some shops in some for some things things are obviously not negotiable but if you are a complete fucking nobody and you go to a music shop today to buy a guitar you are obviously going to pay higher than someone who goes to that shop frequently or if you are a famous musician who goes to that shop frequently okay for for many reasons of course because that musician is going to say that see i got this great guitar from that uh, nice little store who gave me a great discount and that guitarist that famous guitar is saying this to a bunch of students or his friends family he has a bigger circle that means more to the uh, the 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 guitar shop owner of course whereas you will say good things about it only to your parents maybe no one gives a shit or more importantly uh he is going to say what a great guitar this is and that becomes very important and all of his students may be run to that store so there's always differential pricing he also thought that even in the absence of such a mark it might be possible to establish ideal discrimination by detailed separate bargaining with every separate customer needless to say both these strategies are found in south asian market settings precisely because the limited communications infrastructure limits the size of the market and almost makes information a free good people have grown up together and effortlessly known a great deal about each other moving to moving on to another aspect of jajmani the sharing systems and payments in kind that led dumo to imagine that the village is a sort of cooperative these systems of payment are easily amenable to economic explanation they both provide see the problem with dumo is that from time to time he is going on saying things that on the face of it on the, on the superficial top soil level let's say sounds to be a fact seems to be a fact but he is putting that uh, putting all of that on onto religion okay that's the that's the problem of of, of dumo that's the, that's the problematic aspect of dumo's findings these systems of payment are easily amenable to economic explanation they both provide incentives and spread the risks resulting from unpredictable fluctuations in yields and prices but let us return to dumo they both provide incentives and spread the risks resulting from unpredictable fluctuations in yields and prices so dumo says quote what is the principle behind what is called the jajmani system in the first place it makes us of makes use of hereditary personal relationships to express the division of labor each family has a family of specialists at its disposal for each specialized task secondly it regulates prestations and counter prestations in a way which accords with custom for the usual tasks repayment is kind it is not made individually for each particular prestation but is spread over the whole year as is natural for a permanent relationship in an agricultural setting a fact which underlines the limited but effective solidarity which is thus set up between jajman and praja is that 
in many regions those who are considered the main servants of the village enjoy an allotment of land from a communal fund set apart by their patrons it is here that the division of labor that forms an integral part of the caste system may be most clearly understood end quote so now sumit gua says i cannot claim to be the first to say that the above quoted passage is full of misunderstandings first of all the division of labor existed and exists see was it <laughs> This is a similarity between Dirks, Irfan Habib, Declan Quigley, Sumit Guha. All of them are instantly pissed off with Dumo. First of all, the division of labor existed and exists independently of these dyadic, uh, dyadic relations. Okay, division of labor exists and exists independently of these dyadic relations. This is evidenced by the easy replacement of. Just yeah, if you just imagine, if you replace these. uh hereditary specialists occasioned by disputes emigration etc okay this is evidenced by the easy replacement of hereditary specialists occasioned by disputes emigration etc okay clearly then the division of labor arises from the economic efficiency of specialization in most occupations specialists usually do a better job not manusmriti secondly the quantum of prestation or payment is seen by dumo as practically fixed by immutable custom but custom as we shall see below is continually contested and remade by cheating <laughs> evasion flight and violence deployed by both villagers and superior authorities <laughs> finally <laughs> the allocation of land to village servants was not done by their patrons but by extra village authorities typically the patrimonial state state with capital s I must remark that the division of labor is accepted uncritically by Dumo. Yet his schema does not require any division of economic functions, only of the polluting functions, which must be relegated to specialists, regardless of cost. If we admit additional division of labor aimed at securing higher productivity, we have already admitted economic considerations into the model of professional specialization so you see the horse fucking shoe theory is repeatedly uniting libertarians and and marxists but it's the marxists who have not been honest to their ideology unlike irfan habib and have used dumo only to hate hinduism because they did not have the best interests of the lower castes at heart we do we genuinely want to solve casteism because we love this country and this society why would the fuck we want a country where some of our homies behave badly for fucking no reason except birth with other homies of ours okay we really want to solve casteism if we admit so guha is pointing out if we admit additional division of labor aimed at securing higher productivity we have already admitted economic considerations into the model of professional specialization Furthermore, the covert presence and periodic overt deployment of coercion implies that organizations are held together by something more than an unquestioning cooperative orientation to the fundamental values of the community. Okay, <laughs> he's trolling now. अगर भाई मनुष्मिति पढ़ के ये सब हो रहा था तो भोसरी के covert presence of coercion and periodic overt deployment of coercion क्यों क्यों जरूरत पड़ रहा था भाई? सब सब मनुस्मृति मगअप करके क्यों नहीं आराम से सोसाइटी चलाने लगे अगेन इफ देयर इज अ जनरल सोसाइटल कंसेंस अराउंड द आइडिया ऑफ हायर की दिस बाय नो मींस प्रिक्लूड्स एफर्ट्स एट चेंजिंग द इंडिविजुअल एजेंट्स रैंक इन इट ओह फक दिस इज हितेश रंजन चैनल्स रिसर्च रिमेंबर ओके सब कोई रैंक रैंक में उठना चाह रहा है बिकॉज तब इंसेंटिव था रैंक में ऊपर उठना आज रैंक है अपने आप को दलित घोषणा करना तो रिमेंबर अगेन फेक जीनोलॉजीज फेक फैमिली बैकग्राउंड हम हम उस का से आए हैं हम उस देवता से आए हैं कुछ दिन के लिए हम लोअर कास्ट बन गए थे ये सब चुतियापा ऑल ऑफ विच वर बीइंग अटेस्टेड बाय द आईएएस क्वाजा आई आईएएस लाइक ब्राह्मण्स ऑफ यस्टर इयर्स तो अगेन इफ देयर इज अ जनरल सोसाइटल कंसेंसस अराउंड द आइडिया ऑफ हायरार्की दिस बाय नो मींस प्रिक्लूड्स एफर्ट्स एट चेंजिंग द इंडिविजुअल एजेंट्स रैंक इन इट एंड सिंस द अपवर्ड मूवमेंट ऑफ सम इज इक्विवेलेंट टू द डाउनवर्ड डिस्प्लेसमेंट ऑफ अदर्स such differences can only be settled by the deployment of socio economic resources not manusmriti <laughs> expended in the means of coercion or the accessories of status building oh my god <laughs> status building rss kadalla max weber has done so much for us oh my god
<laughs> Anand is saying Marxists will never be honest. That would require them to. <laughs> Everyone had guild groups, yeah. Another and uh, uh, Rishi, is many is maybe na. My opinion, I am not educated enough to say if this is right or not. Maybe someday I'll find out that other people have said it already. But the way our uh, uh, mode of social organizing these uh, uh, guild-like things, birth-based guild-like things, uh, remained and then were. Used as cosplaying fancy dress competitions today. Aaj ka jo hai, wo to state incentives ke wajah se ho raha hai. But it stayed stayed on longer because remember, we are the only society which has not faced the insane amounts of disruptions that every other society has gone through. Okay, we have not seen a, a gigantic uh, economic disruption. Okay, like. Uh, yeah, some amounts of capitalism, of course, in in Mumbai, Chennai, uh, Bengal presidency, Madras presidency, Bombay presidency. Okay, वहाँ पे थोड़ा disruption हुआ, कुछ इधर उधर हो गया, फिर अपने आप में एक एक society हो गया, एक uh, casteism हो गया. But more importantly, हर जगह में ना वो complete conversion जो हो गया था, उसके वजह से complete disruption हो गया society का, organisation का, organisational principles का, incentive structures का, वो भी हमारा नहीं हुआ. तो हमारा थोड़ा और लंबा खींच गया. खींचने के बाद भोजपुरी वालों ने आके उसको और इंसेंटिवाइज कर दिया या दिस इज मैक्स वेबर ऑन स्टेरॉइड नीनर इज इज फोकसिंग ऑन सेमेंटिक्स इयर व्हाई इज मैक्स वेबर आर एस एस का लाइफ इज इवन टेकिंग द ऑपोजिट लाइन ऑफ आर एस एस या गुड पॉइंट बट ही इज एक्चुअली आर एस एस का दल्ला बिकॉज he says good things in the same way that rss does that yes india was such a great country and stuff uh, marxists want to uh, preserve hierarchies after all yes it's a it's a great bengali quote i came up with a few days back for which i'm very proud of myself uh, but nobody knows it nobody has seen it i that i said it in facebook that bekarot to ghuche gele bamponthi bekar hoye jabe okay if if unemployment is solved the communist will become unemployed okay we did during the british era that's why the enormous transition from incredible diversity of guild types and goods to massive numbers becoming farmers yes uh, and not in the entirety of the country of course and also hence the 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 newly uh, branded rigidified and more solidified castes uh, un- unlike the previous era yes of course some people are more equal <laughs> my my this coffee is more coffee but indian system is entirely set up on dumontian yes and everyone fucking agrees ओके लेट्स कंटिन्यू विद द पेपर नाउ सो भाई स्टेटस बेटा सब कुछ बोल दिया दिस पैराग्राफ वाज द मोस्ट इनसेन पैराग्राफ सो फार आई वुड लाइक टू रीड इट वंस मोर फर्दरमोर द कोवर्ट प्रेजेंस एंड पीरियोडिक ओवर्ट डिप्लॉयमेंट ऑफ कोअर्शन इंप्लाइज दैट ऑर्गेनाइजेशंस आर हेल्ड टुगेदर बाय समथिंग मोर देन एन अनक्वेश्चनिंग कोऑपरेटिव ओरिएंटेशन टू द फंडामेंटल वैल्यूज ऑफ द कम्युनिटी अगेन इफ देयर इज अ जनरल सोसाइटल कंसेंसस इफ ओके अगर है भी भोसरी के वैसा कंसेंसस के हाँ हाँ हम सब मनुस्मृति पढ़ लिए हैं अब ऐसा ही चलेगा इवन देन दिस बाई नो मीन्स प्रिक्लूड एफर्ट्स एट चेंजिंग द इंडिविजुअल एजेंट्स रैंक इन इट ओके मनुस्मृति पढ़ के कंसेंसस हो रहा है फिर भी कुछ लोगों को लग रहा है नहीं नहीं अब अब चलो अब थोड़ा ऊपर जाते हैं जाती हर हर में एंड सिंस द अपवर्ड मूवमेंट ऑफ सम is equivalent to the downward displacement of others such differences can only be settled by the deployment of socio economic resources expended in the means of coercion or the accessories of status building in short the presence of hierarchical organizations does not exclude the possibility of individuals nonetheless pursuing their own ends by the deployment of resources calculated as adequate to their ends holy shit which is to say it does not exclude either individualistic rationality or calculation yahi hai the problem with thinking the world is either good or evil and we must move beyond good and evil and read nietzsche pierre bourdieu and rene girard as soon as possible to ye jo hedonist view hai of hindu society or the insane commie view hai of hindu society ke ke sab bhosri wale the sab apne apne matlab marne ke baad sirf bbo ko jalate phir rahe the और सिर्फ खैसिज्म कर रहे थे सब सबको गाली दे रहे थे थूक रहे थे मुंह पे एक्सेट्रा यही चल रहा था और द ऑपोजिट साइड दैट नो वन हैड एनी प्रॉब्लम्स विद एनीवन एवर बोथ आर एब्सोल्युटली हॉर्सशिट आइडियाज देयर वाज इंडिविजुअल इंडिविजुअलिस्टिक रैशनलिटी एंड कैलकुलेशन एंड लाइक आई वाज सेइंग यस्टरडे 
भाई अगर इंडिविजुअलिज्म का कोई भी गुरुत्व नहीं रहता रहता सोसाइटी में तो भाई इतने सारे देवता नहीं लगते कुल देवता ग्राम देवता होने के बाद एक ईष्ट देवता नहीं रहता इंडिविजुअलिज्म इज चेरिश्ड सेलिब्रेटेड इन इंडियन सोसाइटी ऑब्वियसली नॉट एट द कॉस्ट ऑफ द मेन ग्रुप और सोसाइटी ओके तो द फेमस फ्रेज वन फॉर ऑल ऑल फॉर वन ओके द ग्रुप प्रोटेक्ट द इंडिविजुअलिटी ऑफ द पर्सन एंड द इंडिविजुअल ऑल्सो डेडिकेट हिमसेल्फ टू टू डूइंग गुड थिंग्स इन हिज ओन फकिंग वे फॉर द ग्रुप इफ आई मे डाइग्रेस I can also point out that Dumo and others were theorizing in the 20th century when economic activity far from being conducted between myriads of atomized anonymous individuals was largely ordered by complex and hierarchical corporate organizations which engaged strategically with each other and which were in practice constituted of uh, numerous small scale entities with their own unwritten norms and customs by the way this guy's phd is in fucking history see what a great understanding of economics he has I guess historical economics or economic history may be his subject. I wonder what his thesis is. Like, so, can someone Google and and uh, point out what uh, Shumit Guha's uh, PhD was in, or what was his thesis paper? <clears throat> But this has not precluded other maximizing behavior. Maximizing behavior, boy, Bhosri, ke hamara kyu band hoga? So this has not precluded either maximizing behavior by individuals within the setting of targeted discrimination by groups. So to conclude. there is nothing about the observable functioning of village service situations that requires us to turn to the allegedly eternal religious foundations of indian civilization for an ex- explanation oh my god this is a, is a quote for days let's just po- put this in the comment section for fun to conclude there is nothing about the observable functioning of village service institutions that requires us to turn the allegedly eternal religious foundations of indian civilization for an explanation it has nothing to do with those things <laughs> did jajmani have a history for dumo jajmani like the hindu tradition was practically timeless it had no history his source w h wiser the missionary anthropologist thought it had a history and so have several later scholars Wiser who studied a solitary north indian village from the 1920s is usually credited with being the first scholar to formulate the idea of a jajmani as an organized system and one with ancient roots in indic civilization but unlike dumo wiser the the missionary anthropologist believed that what he described in karimpur was a relic of an ancient social organization and therefore quite recent in 1958 wh wiser wrote The Hindu Jajmani system, the Hindu Jajmani system as it stands today in Karimpur, is a disintegrated form of the ancient village commune. The Hindu Jajmani system, as it stands today in Karimpur, is ancient in that it recognizes the claims of the different occupational groups to a share of the earnings of the village as a whole, but it is not ancient in its detailed form as prescribed in the preceding pages. Clearly, end quote. Clearly, wiser the the missionary anthropologist believed that. something approximating to the western indian baluta system had existed almost until its until his arrival this had then disintegrated to generate jajmani in this respect he would agree with peter mayer or peter mayer who de- whose detailed analysis of the evidence on jajmani in english language sources was published in 1993 mayer traced the earliest english mention of jajmani to yule and bernal's hobson jobson of 1855 a complete description of a dy- dyadic relationship akin to that depicted by wiser the missionary anthropologist was found in eah blunt's census report of 1911 for the united provinces meaning up okay ek bar for clarification of everyone let's look at the exact definition of dyadic relations okay dyadic means uh, uh, okay yeah so so between two two people or two two uh, things or a couple etc okay dono ke beech mein to uh ha mayor Peter Mayer also presented a novel view of jajmani he saw it as a reaction by various service groups to new opportunities and pressures arising out of british rule and associated changes in the urban and rural economies notably he saw it as resulting from the accelerated break up of collective village tenures in which the land holding body collectively paid the land tax and regulated the services of the various village servants the quote unquote exclusive right to serve individual families of patrons that came to be called jajmani he speculatively suggests may have originated no later than the settlement of british civil servants and others in the towns of north india he is also at pains to confine it to northern india and to distinguish it and its precursors 
फ्रॉम द विलेज सर्वेंट सिस्टम ऑफ इंडियन पेनिसुला ओके नॉर्थ साउथ डिवाइड यहाँ पे बना लिया है ये लोगों ने He concludes that Jajmani was quote unquote probably in widespread existence existence in Uttar Pradesh for less than thirty years when uh, Blunt first described it in nineteen eleven. Blunt continued to examine the issue of caste though sub through subsequent decades. He concluded that occupational castes, some of whom exercised traditional claims upon Jajmans, actually originated in artisanal guilds of the first millennium CE and would in the twentieth century. Move towards trade unionism, irrespective of caste. <laughs> Anand Sridhar, कहाँ पे है? See, <clears throat> trade unionism होगा ही जब जब caste होगा. An identical impulse. created the trade guilds the functional castes and the 20th century landholders associations and mazdoor sabhas workers associations uh, namely the desire of men with common interests to unite for the protection of those interests okay yahi to hai guild aaj ka tollywood guild uh, union everything association workers association etc to thus the author of perhaps the only large scale service survey of caste in the middle gangetic plains saw not merely jajmani but All inter-caste economic relations generally as exclusively economic in nature. देखो भाई कितना कितना चुतियापा हमको सिखाया गया है about casteism forever and after, forever and ever. Okay, Guha's thesis was on Maharashtra's colonial economics. He writes extensively about Maharashtra. I should read this. Hmm. Honestly, free and dynamic trade guilds are the purest actionable form of libertarianism. <laughs> An identical impulse created trade guilds, the functional castes, and the 20th century landholders associations and mazdoor sabhas or workers associations, namely the desire of men with common interests to unite for the protection of those interests. ये है caste और उसके basis पे तुम्हारा एक status होगा कि तुम कितना cultural capital acquire कर पाते हो, be depending on your amount of earning and depending also your earning will depend upon how important your service, that job you do, is to society of course. these things are this is how it's related so it has it's not like it has nothing to do with class it has it does have a bit to do with economics of course but it's not just economics uh, the caste is not just economics uh, but you see these things it, it's involved with status economics and uh, workers guilds and stuff thus the author of perhaps the only large scale survey of caste in the middle gangetic plains by by uh, I, i when i say it does have has something to do with economics or nothing to do with economics i mean class so castes are castes they are not class enter, uh, entirely thus the author of perhaps the only large scale survey of caste in the middle gangetic plains so not merely jajmani but all inter caste economic relations generally as exclusively economic in nature thus uh, the distance of this from the dumontian idea of the religious encompassing the economic need hardly be stressed okay brahmins controlling the society is absolutely devastated destroyed in this sentence for of, of course uh, after many times already uh, being done by irfan habib darks declan quigley uh, doyaboti roy now <clears throat> dr sumit guha professor of history at university of texas austin the distance of this fact from the dumontian idea of the religious encompassing the economic need hardly be stressed okay so in other words the religious does not encompass the economic in in our society just like any other society migrants markets and institutions peter mayer's emphasis on changing regionally diverse and entrepreneurial nature of the interhousehold relations is well taken and is supported by a valuable ethnographic source the report of the committee on customary rights to scavenging published by the government of india in 1966 The committee corresponded with a number of state governments and also made local inquiries in many parts of northern and southern India before submitting its report in 1966. The "quote unquote" customary right described had all the features of what is referred to as jajmani. One particular scavenger acquires a right to clean such latrines as against another scavenger. Ah, we will get into this. Ah, uh, but more importantly, just sort as sort of a shout out. Remember, all these papers are being sent to me by Mr. Sociologist. and uh, he is coming to our podcast hiding his face anonymously 
Who's to blame for this? M. Shastri, stop giving out spoilers to my plans. Yehi mere kal ka paper ka plan hai. Though I'm tomorrow going to a nice discussion where uh, the co-author of uh, uh, the, the book on Bangladeshi Hindus uh, with Deep Haldar, co-author Dr. Abhishek Bishash and Dr. Koshi Gangopadhyay will be. I'm going to such an event. Aaj, aaj bhi ek badia event tha with another sociologist. Wo cancel ho gaya. So, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> I, have, I have that paper. Mr. So- so- sociologist sent this to me months back. We are going to get into it very soon, either tomorrow or day after tomorrow, okay? But, guys, can you can you think, why are these... No, no, Anand. Not because of that, just. If he had a nice post in a uh, nice university, even then he could do it. He doesn't have uh, job security at the moment. If he comes out as these as th- with this identity, like Deep Haldar now has, he is not going to progress in his career anymore. <clears throat> he is going to have to teach in uh, wo Central Center for Indic Studies and stuff. Wo, wo kharaab to nahi hai, magar credential research ka to ek value hai. We can now conclude that at least. Wo kaise hoga? So, <clears throat> Anand is saying, ah, the system, yes. The, the, the famous, the fabled system. The proverbial so one particular scavenger acquires a right to clean such latrines as against another scavenger. Okay, job security. In small towns, he is generally paid in kind, a daily roti, and some prerequisites uh, like food or clothes, etc. On some special occasions like births, marriages, deaths, etc. varying with the status of the householder. Often in bigger towns, he is also paid partially in cash, and in cities, he is generally paid only in cash. It is also that in times of need, they sell or mortgage their rights to other scavengers in the same manner as one does with one's property. Where where customary rights exist in the old form, the householder can change his scavenger only with the consent of the latter. Scavenger ka consent. Oh my God. Raja Manu ne ye sab kya lik diya. In such cases, the old scavenger enters into a deal with the new one who pays the former <laughs> some amount according to the status of the householder. <laughs> These transactions in common parlance are known as the selling of a particular brit. And see, we think our our ancients were, were idiots, nice people doing meditation all day. So, uh, and and uh, someone was telling me, you know, in our live stream, I, I, Anand Sridhar or, or Mr. Socialist himself, that this, this is what kind of happens in Gujarat as well, that uh, the Gujaratis who do apply for government jobs for these sorts of jobs, they are not actually doing those jobs themselves. They are actually hired, hiring three people under them to do, do, do those jobs for, for lesser money. <clears throat> so the status of human feces in the purity pollution schema must be obvious. <laughs> he is trolling now. If Jajmani was an institution designed to cope with this and other polluting substances, it should have been present almost everywhere. But con- contrary to Dumo's belief that Jajmani was more or less in universal in India, the committee found the old form or what the anthropological literature described as Jajmani did not extend even to eastern Uttar Pradesh. It was found in the west and center of that state in Rajasthan, in Madhya Pradesh, excluding the eastern Mahakoshal present Chhattisgarh region, mainly in the Saurashtra region of Gujarat, in Punjab and in predominantly Muslim areas of Jammu and Kashmir. It was also found as a recent in- importation in the Telangana districts of Andhra Pradesh and parts of Marathwara in eastern Maharashtra. So, if you are all reading the follow Kahe Bhosri ke sirf kuch mein ho hai. The committee also sought to discover the origins of the system. It remarked on the fact that indoor latrines were few in the countryside and had usually belonged to people of high status who would not relieve themselves al fresco, meaning <laughs> randomly anywhere. These were cleaned by the village sweepers, who like other rural servants, had a claim in each harvest. The quantity of food grains given to them was fixed according to the status of the judgment. Status, status, bar bar ye word hai. status, status, status. Max Weber ka kaam hai ye. By the way, his name is Max, not Max Weber, okay? It's Max Weber, Weber. This type of judgment system still prevails in many areas. Apart from food grains and in some cases land, these artisans also got new or old clothes annually and prerequisites on ceremonial occasions like births and marriages and during festivals. The committee plausibly suggested that wealthy rural households gradually moved to the towns and accompanied by their servants. 
the latter then sought to monopolize their patrons by the custom described above long distance migration from areas where the practice was prevalent could also transfer the usage thus <laughs> transfer the usage bhai kya genius hai manusmriti mein ha sab kuch manusmriti mein tha aur dharma shastra mein tha thus numbers of balmikis from western uttar pradesh and present day haryana migrated to the old hyderabad state and divided the growing urban areas into beats held under customary law older local groups may have withdrawn or been brought, uh, bought out in marathwada also there is no local scavenging caste except a few muslim sheikhs sheikhs mahars do only sweeping work scavengers from north india purchased brits from local scavengers generally muslim sheikhs it is evident that economic calculation was very much present in this transaction oh my god they were not following manuspriti nor indeed was rent seeking and finding unknown rent seeking and finding okay bracket mein diya hai finding <laughs> rent seeking and finding was not unknown in the town of vidisha madhya pradesh there were quote only 18 bhangis having brit jajmani subsequently it was revealed that all of them had employed servants usually municipal sweepers not having their own brits for cleaning private latrines the latter are only allowed to take rotis from households served by them it was alleged that if the cash income from the family served by a tenant scavenger was say rupees uh, 25 paisa the the ilakedar would give only rupee rupees 2 uh, paisa to the servant and pocket the rest of the money yeah that's it that is what i just uh, gave an example of in in uh, gujarat's uh, government uh, service and stuff a lot of people who seek these jobs in gujarat were not actually doing those jobs and even today you will see uh, wo scavenging ke liye i mean wo municipal sweepers and all ke liye uske samne badhiya line rehta hai there were also entrepreneurs who acquired monopolies in newly urbanizing areas these intermediaries okay there were also entrepreneurs who acquired monopolies in newly urbanizing areas क्योंकि मैक्स वेबर ने तो बोला है कि इंडिया इज द ओनली इज इज अ कंट्री व्हिच हैड द लीस्ट अमाउंट ऑफ एंटी क्रेमेटिज्म इन द होल वर्ल्ड एंटी क्रेमेटिज्म मींस हर हर सोसाइटी में थोड़ा बहुत ये रहता है हां पैसा क्या है हाथ की महल एटसेट्रा दैट इज कॉल्ड एंटी क्रेमेटिज्म इंडिया हैड लीस्ट ऑफ अमाउंट ऑफ दैट सो दीस इंटरमीडिएटरीज और कॉन्ट्रैक्टर्स बाय देयर शूडनेस और क्लेवरनेस एंटर इनटू नेगोशिएशंस विद न्यू कॉलोनाइजर्स और डेवलपर्स एंड सेट अप न्यू जागीर्स this was also a channel for the investment of capital the buyers of brits in marathwada were often financed by balmiki capitalists in ayad oh my god that's a phrase i never thought i would hear balmiki capitalists this sounds a great looks like a sounds like a great name for a band no hi we are the balmiki capitalists uh <clears throat> we play only ambedkarite metal so financed by balmiki capitalists in hyderabad at high rates of interest despite so much evidence for adaptation to economic opportunity the committee persisted in seeing disputes between householders and scavengers as a recent departure from traditional mutualism and ancient harmony okay the committee persisted in seeing disputes between householders and scavengers as a recent departure from traditional mutualism and ancient harmony this was unsupported by any evidence and in fact as we shall see below the earliest records of this system are records of disputes and conflicts okay वो कमिटी बोल रहा है कि भाई पहले बहुत बढ़िया था सब लोगों में एकदम भाईचारा था हाल ही में ये लोग भोसी वाले बन गए हैं एंड सुमित गोइस पॉइंटेड आउट पॉइंटिंग आउट दैट दिस इज अनसपोर्टेड बाय एनी एनी एविडेंस एज वी शैल सी बिलो द अर्लीएस्ट रिकॉर्ड्स ऑफ दिस सिस्टम आर रिकॉर्ड्स फुल ऑफ डिस्प्यूट्स एंड कॉन्फ्लिक्ट्स लोल much of the evidence here that supports peter mayer's contention that the jajmani system was in many ways an innovation simon commander like mayer is skeptical of the cultural <laughs> explanations of the relationships and prefers to view them as a form of labor relation a type of peace rated labor payment in kind which goes into decline in the later colonial era as a consequence of migration rising prices and growing pressure on the land a view not supported by the evidence cited above oh Mayer is in fact engaged in attempt to portray Jajmani as a novel and transitional relationship of service and payment one which lasted little more than half a century and whose rise and decay may both be located within the colonial era hmm he also confines his analysis to north india deprecating the attempts made by bidelman and, and others including wiser to assimilate the north indian dyadic relationships with the village servant systems found in the much uh, in much of southern and western india radical though mayer and commanders 
critics of Jajmani as an ancient system may be. Yet they now see what a brilliant research uh, this this Sumit Gu has done. See what a brilliant scholar he is. He's pointing out that yes, mayor and commanders critics of Jajmani as an ancient system is probably correct, but then they fall into the same trap set by uh, our uh, missionary anthropologist Wiser in subscribing to the idea that village community and village servant system was an ancient fun functional organization whose origins are presumably lost in the mists of time. The rest of this paper will attempt a history of that organization itself. Now, a bit of break and a sip of coffee. <clears throat> Uh, Adju is saying, what I meant is that they are still contracted by the municipality to clean up gutters when there are blockages. News of them dying in cleaning gutters is still part of the news in Mumbai. Yes. Because of the general uh, horseshit uh, nature of our public infrastructure, which is horseshit because of our babus. They would get stipends from kings and would live with uh, a majority of society. Obviously, the problem is Westerners superimpose Greek citizens to Indian Kshatriyas. Yeah, Balmiki capitalist. Okay, uh, so let's continue. The village servant system from the 17th to the 20th century. This is the name of the paper, by the way. The late H.K. Fukuzawa was perhaps the earliest uh, scholar to attack the issue of Baluta and Jajmani in the pre-colonial period and to use contemporary sources rather than the conveniently accessible colonial, colonial reconstructions of the period. He cogently warned that what is taken as traditional or extant from time immemorial may actually have developed in the very recent past. As Fukuzawa's article is readily available, it is unnecessary for me to do more than list his main conclusions. Firstly, he showed that the functionaries were maintained by the village as a territorial whole, thus conforming the village servant rather than the Jajmani type of relation. He writes, there was one Baluta Watan, Watan uh, for Baluta Watan for every occupation in a village. Division of a Watan did not increase its number. Each sharer of the divided Watan was just considered or Watan or Watan, I don't know how to pronounce this. Division of a Watan did not increase its number. Each sharer of the divided Watan was considered to have a fraction of it. Okay. Each sharer of the divided Watan was considered to have a fraction of it. Moreover, what was divided was not the sphere of service, but the emoluments from the Watan, from the Watan. Therefore, in the process of division of a Watan, the related Baluta servants were not transformed from being the servants of the village to becoming the servants of the of certain specific families. But Fukuzawa continues, they were differentiated into those who held their posts as a patrimony or watan and those who were sojourners without such rights. Secondly, there were Brahmans functioning as priests who had exclusive claims to serve specific castes but not the village as a whole. These households could be seen as having a Jajmani relation to those Brahmans. Carnivorous villagers would have a Jajmani relation with the Maulana, a functionary probably added in western Maharashtra under the Sultanates of Ahmednagar and Bijapur, circa 1500 to 1650 AD. Writing in 1819, Thomas Coates described this functionary as existing in many villages. Quote, the Mahomedan sacrificer kills the sheep at sacrifices and festivals. His wages are a portion of grain and straw. End quote. H. H. Mann found the institution still in place a century later. Fukuzawa traced a reference to the village servant system in Max Weber, who had termed it demiurgic. Weber believed that Indian villages had allotted garden land and grazing common to craftsmen, temple priests, barbers, laundrymen, and all kinds of laborers belonging to the village, the village establishment. They, ho they hold on, they hold on a demiurgic basis, that is, they are not paid for their work in detail but stand in the service of the community in return for a share in the land or in the harvest. What these village-centered models forget is that the community itself stood in the service of a demanding and peremptory set of overlords. Okay? What these village-centered models forget is that the community itself stood in the service of a demanding and peremptory set of overlords. Arbitrary demands for money, labor service, and produce were an inescapable feature of rural and urban life for most people. Forced labor for the needs of officials and other gentry was a heavy and erratic burden, and much of the energy of quote unquote village servants was in fact expended in rendering this government service so as to prevent random villagers being conscripted for it. 
this was and and these things also go on forever and after in any society like just today a relative my, of mine was saying that uh she she got into an auto and uh, the auto wala was very proudly saying that i i ride auto all day but uh, uh during the night i <clears throat> i work for a uh famous uh, i'm not going to name obviously a famous uh, trinamool person uh he's a uh, he works in real estate and, and stuff i get called randomly in the middle of the night and i i have to go so the question arises first of all why is a situation like that where he is called in the middle of the night and he has to go secondly what kind of real estate production <laughs> or or work asks you to call up a call up an auto wala in the middle of the night no no points for guessing guys this was evident when sykes surveyed western maharashtra in 1825 to through 29 quote occasionally the answers to uh, answer to my inquiries respecting the duties of the mahars was that they were to do everything they were ordered whether by the patil the village corporation or by the government so for instance when nimbalkar nimbalkar of of karmalle had one of his pagas pagas or pagas of horse stationed near wangi the mahars worked gratuitously for 6 months in the year in the stables on the removal of the paga nimbalkar levied a tax on the mahars in place of 6 months stable work but did not remit any of their ordinary duties lol see this is this is now where communism comes into the forefront and the libertarian libertarianish aspect of the system goes takes a back stage in another township in another township the mahars had earlier had the specific duties of gratis, gratuitously supplying all government officers who came into the district and partly also the hill forts with dry wood and grass these demands continued under british rule ending perhaps only with the introduction of motor motor transport disruption bada disruption hoga ye sab cheez band ho jayega thus sj thakre thakre principal collector uh oh this is not thakre this is thakre uh, like william makepeace thakre right yeah, this is a british british surname thus sj thakre principal collector uh wrote from dharwad in 1824 as very few coolies are to be found here uh, and the class of dhairs and other parias is quite insufficient to supply the demand the amildars peons often press into servicemen who have never carried loads in their lives until the officers of our government impressed them okay so you see <clears throat> multiple jobs and stuff upskilling and uh, ye sab ho raha hai tab bhi when two or 300 coolies are required and only a days notice is given for procuring them the peons often seize upon inhabitants with the exception of brahmins and uh, saukars bankers indiscriminately drive them in a herd to the place of rendezvous and pen them like cattle until the arrival of the baggage this is how caste system benefited the uh, the system the, the the ideas of castes benefited british as well thackeray sought to revive what he believed was old usage and issued a proclamation requiring that quote the village officer is on no account to press the the riots or routes peasants for coolies but is to procure them without violence from the lower classes of bedurs dhairs dhungurs and other similar castes accustomed to carry burdens should there be no sufficient number of such persons the deficiency deficiency shall be supplied from the neighboring villages end quote it is evident that the colonial administration was thus reinforcing and reviving a system of village responsibility that would in turn reinforce the baluta system if the upper caste villagers did not maintain an adequate number of village servants for such occasions they risked being violently conscripted to replace them to tum palo coolies nahi to bhosika tumko khud jana padega landless and poor households were often selectively burdened by such exactions for example in the 1820s groups of bheel tribals were induced to come down from the hills and settle near the villages in khandesh north maharashtra colonial officials believed that they would be integrated into the village servant system and live peacefully thereafter as they had quote unquote traditionally done the struggle over what was traditional <laughs> and customary now began and the officer responsible for their res- resettlement warned that oppression could force them back into outlawry outlawry he recommended that services expected to be performed by bheels of the plains in the vicinity of hindu villages in consideration of grants of land required to be more strictly defined no bheel should be compelled to labor or forced to plow for less than hindu laborers 
or for less wages than other plowmen receive. The remuneration, if in money, grain or clothes, should be distinctly specified. Another most serious grievance is that in a village, however well populated, not a cart, a bullock, a driver, guide or begari, forced laborer, will be furnished by the native local authorities from the caste inhabitants whilst any can possibly uh, wh why when whilst any can possibly pr be pressed from the limited resources of the wretched bheels that are at and in the neighborhood of the village agar bheel hai to unko use karo such tussles did not only occur with socially alien groups like the bheels they were a uh, did not only occur with socially alien groups like the bheels they were a general feature of the times when the agrarian order was recovering from war or famine see sumit guha is being so fair he's saying Oh, that yes, these were bad things happening, but it, these were general features of those times because it was an agrarian order which was recovering from war or famine. <clears throat> Aju, yes, yes, Balathakre, uh, Balathakre is, I think, grandfather was a fan of William Makepeace Thackeray, uh, for which he, they, they just adopted the name <laughs> Thackeray, lol. This was the case in Pune district around 1710 when Pilaji Jadav, an important official of the Maratha state, wrote to the village officers of the region, quote, You reported that your province had long been desolate, but that, is, that, but that it was now fortunately being resettled once again. And all the villagers, all the villages was populated once more. Abad Rahitu, the holders of the 12 bat balutas had all returned to the villages, but they began demanding exorbitant amounts in the name of customary dues. They demanded everything you, the farmers, possessed on account of dues. So you asked us to fix the dues. So we collected everyone and considered past usage and fixed the customs. Everyone is now to conform to this settlement. End quote. Such pronouncements may have reduced conflicts, but conflict was always present. And record as individuals felt that they could exploit some fresh advantage. Yehi to hoga. I quote one example from the surviving records of the period. In the mid-18th century, Ranoji, the headman of a village near Saswad, or Saswad complained of the novel and excessive uh, demands made by the village astrologer Brahman Joshi. He stated that his functionary had hitherto accepted various small cash payments from poorer families in lieu of the shawl he was entitled to receiving for officiating at weddings. Okay. <laughs> he stated, <laughs> this is, this is uh, hilarious. In the mid-18th century, Ranoji, the headman of a village near Saswad, complained of the novel and excessive demands made by the village astrologer, astrologer Brahmin Joshi. He stated that this functionary, the Joshi, had hitherto accepted various small cash payments from poor fam poorer families in lieu of the shawl he was entitled to receive for officiating at weddings. But he was now forcibly extracting a shawl from everyone. Again, he had formerly received baluta dues after the paying capacity of the farmer the yield of the field and the quality of the season had all been taken into account in other words he had bargained from a position of weakness but now he simply sent his rang uh, rangari slave woman to the fields with a horse and she took as large a bundle as she wanted and loaded it on the horse if the farmer protested she abused him wildly the slave woman of the brahman joshi is abusing the farmer so you see Proximity to power is everything. When the headman had gone to speak with the Joshi about this, the latter had threatened to beat him with a stick. <laughs> the change in behavior can be explained by the fact that the Joshi was now connected by marriage to the hereditary officers of the subdivision. Clearly, again, proximity to power. Clearly, he was emboldened by his new alliance to enlarge his prerequisites beyond the earlier customary level. तो भोसरी के कहा कहा मनुस्मृति कोई कोई कहीं पे कोई मनुस्मृति को, को मतलब याद भी नहीं रख रहा है द फैक्ट ऑफ कॉन्स्टेंट इफ लेस ड्रोमैटिक डिकरिंग ओवर द क्वांटिटी एंड क्वालिटी ऑफ पेमेंट्स वर सजेस्टेड बाय डब्ल्यू एच साइक्स हु ट्रेवल थ्रू वेस्टर्न महाराष्ट्र फॉर फोर इयर्स 1825 थ्रू 1829 इन इज कैपेसिटी एज स्टैटिस्टिकल रिपोर्टर टू द गवर्नमेंट ऑफ बॉम्बे एंड मेड मिनिट इंक्वायरीज इंक्वायरीज इन डजन ऑफ विलेजेस कोट Very rarely could I get either farmer or uh, bulutedar bulute to state specifically what the one gave and the other was entitled to receive. It depended very much upon the crops and also upon the extent of services performed or each individual cultivator. End quote. 
He was told by farmers in many parts of the region that they surrendered a quarter of the crop on account of Baluta and other dues in and other dues in kind. Occasionally, such friction erupted into full-scale confrontation. So, for instance, the dispute between the Maharaj of Iraq and its headman went up to the great noble uh, Fatesin Fatesin Bhosle. Oh, so Fateh Singh Bhosle, I guess. Kya naam likha hai bhai? Fateh Singh Bhosle in 1738 and was settled only at his discretion. The document enumerated the dues and duties of the Mahars on various occasions and ordered both sides to conform. Even religious functions were open to contest. Thus, in 1754, the Mahars of Saswar contested the right of the monks to carry an earthen pot around the village as a part of the right of exorcism. They were asked to uh, they were asked to produce evidence from the neighboring villages that Mahars did indeed have such rights. They sought to do so and then realized that this was against the usage of the country and withdrew their claims. Country meaning village. These two rival low caste communities were often used to curb each other. In Sarola Kasar, a village in Ahmednagar district, the villagers replaced the hereditary Mahars with monks at some time in the 1920s. Oh shit. Mahars and monks ke beech mein bawal chal raha hai. So we may see that a good deal more than agreement on fundamental values. <laughs> So-called fundamental values. Manusmriti etc. So we see that a good deal more than agreement on fundamental values was needed to ensure the, the sharing of the grain heap that Neil, Dumo and others would see as a spontaneous social process shaped by fundamental spiritual values. Okay? Or yahan pe maang aur mahar bawal kar rahe <laughs> this, this paper is insane. Oh my God. More extensive monetization. The gradual distinction of uh, forced labor for government purposes and social protests by the Dalit classes marked relations between farmers and village servants by the early 20th century. This tension forms a major theme in a... <laughs> oh my God. Shit. Farmer or village servant ke bich bawal. This tension forms a major theme in an early classic of Maharashtrian rural so sociology. T. N. Atre's uh, Garnvgada or Gada, which is, uh, however, written exclusively from the landholder's point of view. Atre, uh, a middle ranking colonial official with many decades' experience, states that undressed rural grievances were advertised by the poisoning of cattle. Or kuch nahi mila, jake khunnas nikal diya bhosri ke gai ke upar. If such cases became frequent in a village, then the government authorities temporarily confiscated the Mahar's patrimony on the assumption that they were behind the poisonings. Atre also describes how the district officers had, under Section 18 of the Watan Act, to assemble panchayats headed by the district collector in order to settle these disputes. If the panchayats failed to reach a decision within seven days, then the collector gave a binding award. Atre also wrote that the Mahars now only rendered free service to important people such as the headmen, the district hereditary officers and a few big farmers and that too often, uh, that too after they had been sought out and summoned. Why is Sumit Guha not uh, head of uh, department in any sociology faculty in India? Or history even. The collection of customary dues is presented as a deeply conflict-ridden process. For example, he describes how village watchmen always went in bands to confront the farmer in his field. Why isn't this guy in any even Indian private institution? Why isn't he in any Indian think tank? The collection of customary dues is presented as a deeply conflict-ridden process. For example, he describes how village watchmen always went in bands to confront the farmer in his field. Quote, going in a band means that argument, pressure and threat are deployed. So you see, real estate ka admi ek auto wala ko bulata hai? this is what? Going in a band means that argument, pressure and threat are deployed. To sum up, claims of entitlement, friendly pleas, begging, flattery and pilferage follow each other like beads on the same thread. Aha, poetic ho gaya tachanak. So, claims of entitlement, friendly pleas, begging, flattery and pilferage, sam dam dand bhed, follow each other like beads on the same thread. 
<laughs> if caught pilfering by an en- enraged farmer, Atre continues, the landless castes appeased him by saying, quote, Bali Raja, we are your footwear. How can we fill our stomachs? If that does not make him subside, these people say, well, well, is it thus? And utter words importing bloodshed and mayhem. The, fo- the poor farmer, Kunbi, fears that they may fulfill their threats by theft, by arson or by poisoning his cattle. So, he perforce allows them to carry away what they have already pilfered. End quote. Shit. Atre presents a vivid but one-sided view of the situation. In reality, here as in North India, the balance of power was tilted in favor of the landowners and the 20th century saw a steady decline in the dues received by village servants. The Gokhel Institute of Pune pioneered rural surveys in Western India in the 1930s and has maintained a fine tradition of intensive village studies. M.B. Jagtap worked on the first survey of Y subdivision in 1936 through 38 and on resurveys in 1942 through uh, 1943, 1944 to 45, 59 to 60, and then 66 to 67. He lived mainly in his study villages from 1935 through 1952. Uh, to, to 1952, not through, so not the entire time. His study of these villages through 30 years was published in 1970. What did he Already by the 1930s, there were several villages without uh, balutedars, without balutedars now, and others where some functions were performed by craftsmen from elsewhere for cash payment. By the 1950s, some balutedars had also ceased asking for, had stopped asking for baluta and preferred to work for cash payment. Jagtap, and then of course inflation starts going up, and of course GDP grows up. Uh, Jagtap notes that the baluta system was more completely preserved in villages like Gulumb. Uh, away away from the main roads which depended more on local supplies and services. Of course, no economic disruption is going on there. In 1936 through 37, 10.98% of the main food grain crops was paid out to Balutedars in Gulumb as against a low of 5.54% in well-connected Ozar Day or Ozard. The average for three villages was 7.04%. We may recollect that in the 1820s, Sykes had been told that 25% of the crop was paid out as dues in kind. By 59, 1959 through 1960, the share had fallen to 3.69%. And as food prices rose sharply in the 1960s, because of our socialism, to a negligible 1.83% in 1966 through 67. Jagtap explained this by the stoppage of payments to Balutedars who were no longer needed and the employment of craftsmen on a cash basis as required. Technological change also made it profitable to displace some to, to, to displace some. Pumps replaced leather buckets in buckets in irrigation, and the services of the leather worker came to an end. For example, okay. So largest proportionate reduction uh dumo in payments uh to, to sacred fun- function <laughs> feels the dumo control karai. The largest proportionate reduction was in payments to sacred functionaries. Or uske liye bracket me likha lik diya. Okay, Deko, remember what Dumo said? Deko, agar Dumo ko follow kar rahe te, to bhai sabse kam payment, reduction in payment, sacred functionary ko kahe hua. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Achanak side mein se Dumo ka naam ghusa diya. Sif troll karne ke liye. Yes, Anand. Yes. This is true anthropology. This is why we have to fund our tax. But Anand, since you are liking this paper, you will absolutely love yesterday's paper as well. Nicholas B. Dirks' paper yesterday, okay. There also, we, we had to repeatedly exclaim that this is what we fund people for. This is true historical anthropology. You won't, you won't believe what a brilliant job he has done yesterday, and mainly with South India. Exam time, it's not there, but I karta to uh, uh. <laughs> 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 watchman nahi tha. Watan mera watan ka watan. Okay, so watan. By the way, it is environmentalists aka commie allies that extend the immense misery of sewage cleaners. In Pune, they stalled construction of STP. Are bhai, impressed ye bhosti ke communi- communists hamesha har jaga pe chutiya same kaam karte. Uh, I, I don't remember if I've told you this example. I used to discuss this in my channel earlier on. That there's a place, a uh, very famous sea beach in West Bengal. 
called Bokkhali, okay? Uh, the most famous is Digha Mondarmoni, etc. The other famous one is Bokkhali. It's in a little different direction. So, on the way to Bokkhali, you have to cross a river called uh, Hataniya Duaniya, okay? So, that Hataniya Duaniya has a bridge over it only now. Even though people have been going to Bokkhali as tourists for decades and decades. Uh, the last time I went to Bokkhali uh, was in 2016 or 17 early on, uh, on my bike. I've been to Bokkhali on my bike two times and many times as a kid, even once I uh, reached college as well. It's a very famous uh, uh, beach hangout for, for all kids in South Bengal. So I had to put up my bike once on a small boat. And after that, people told me that, idiot, don't ever put your bike on a boat. It might just sink. Put it on, on, on those gigantic trawlers, okay? But which are rare in the day. So I had to put up, put it up in a trawler and they take up trucks and cars, etc. You have to wait for these things to cross that one river. Because of that one inconvenience, Bokkhali has not developed or become as popular as Diga. Okay. Although Bokkhali is actually closer to a lot of South Bengal areas. People would find it more affordable to go to Bokkhali. What was the excuse for not building that bridge? The boatmen will lose their professions. Okay. So again, what do these uh, unknowingly unconscious casteist commies end up doing they prefer that hereditarily boatmen's kids become boatmen their services are guaranteed in that in that fucking boat driving uh, profession okay and on the other hand bokkhali remains less developed whereas if it had uh, had a bridge decades back it could be a much developed state and the boatman's son would have some other fucking job in that area a concept unthinkable for a commie Now that it would be interesting to see what was property rights prior to British colonization. Guha suggests property right was different prior to British. Hmm. Casts of the mind. Yeah. This one and the uh, yesterday's paper. When can we have papers like that again? Uh, a few days later, uh, as as soon as possible. Basically, the the paper that uh, was mentioned by M Shastri uh, <laughs> a while back. Okay, <laughs> serving the serving barbarians to save dharma, etc. And uh, let me tell you about another sociologist, okay? He is a sort of mysterious sociologist on steroids, okay? Uh, mysterious sociologist talks about him as if he's uh, some sort of deity and stuff, okay? Now, I'm in contact with him. He's also not going to ever come on my podcast uh, because it will taint his career and because he also does not have any professional, uh, let's say, uh, opportunities in India. He is in a very, very elite institution elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> so he is also now, he has also now sent me two insanely fascinating papers. Okay. And I have been sending uh, my live streams to him for the last few days. So his papers are also going to be fucking insane. Okay. He is a mysterious sociologist on, on, on 100x. Okay. He's that qualified actually. He has that many publications and stuff. And maybe someday you will know his name. Maybe you will never know his name if this is how our government works. But these will these are the people who will have to work behind the shadows. All Indians should read Plato's Republic. Uh, Socrates exposed Marxism before Marx. <laughs> By the way, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever be the case, I'm not a Maratha. My ancestors are Marathi living in Mumbai since the past 900 years based on folk songs of my community. Uh, what do you think about collaboratively uh, writing a book? We have a lot of folks who have read papers with you. Maybe we can all write a chapter. That would be nice. Uh, I have been planning a book someday, obviously in the near future, about how I became a Bengali Hindu. That's the plan I have for my book. He demolishes two elite kids on Greece who ate similar to the stupid elites <laughs> who like communism today, lol. <laughs> so, okay, let's uh, continue with the paper now. So, bhai, aisa, aisa tradition, parampara, sanskar tha, ke jab, jab chance mila bhosri ke sab se pehle, salary kam kar diya, sacred functionary ka. <laughs> parampara, anushasan, pratishtha. The murder of Mahatma Gandhi by a Brahman led to the stoppage of payments to the Joshi in Gulumb and Kafte after 1948. By the 1960s, payments to the Mahars had also ended. Sab ke saad. Sabko, sabko, bikari badne ka mauka milega. Dhakka mukki mat karo. Hum socialist hai. Hum, we will all be equally bikari. The refusal of services and rejection of beggarly payments in kind were also part of the Ambedkarite movement from the late 1920s and Daya Power's memoirs record how these practices were eroding 
as early as the 1930s the refusal of services and rejection of beggarly payments in kind were also part of the ambedkarite movement from the late 1920s okay to services hi reject kar diya beggarly payment hai isliye uske badle mein better kuch mila kya i wonder or maybe that, that's why uh, reservation then um jagtap studied only three villages uh, but two members of the gokhel institute staff used the data from the survey of a sample of 72 villages in eight districts carried out in 1951 through 52 to write uh, maharashtra chi gramina samaj rachna the disintegration of the baluta system was already evident landless families paid cash for any services they required and in many villages the balutedars had divided client households among themselves mahars were village functionaries in 66 out of 72 villages but only those serving government uh, serving government actually received any dues from the villagers lol mahars were village functionaries functionaries in 66 out of 72 villages but only those mahars who were serving government actually received any dues from the villagers they served by rotation and had to wait years for their turns to come up the mahars were much more alienated from the village system than the func- than other functionaries were and obviously the socialist direction of the rest of the country was not helping them at all the carpenter was still the most important functionary and found in 60 villages dues varied from village to village but were usually paid per plow or a sort of piece rate iron work being more durable the smith was a balutedar in only 25 villages even there cash had to be paid for some jobs many smiths remember in the beginning guys uh, also anand since you have not watched from the beginning hamare uh, uh, sumit guha mentions in the in the interview we discussed in the very beginning that you know you see just like smiths were a caste elsewhere he he talks about smiths like that many smiths preferred to locate themselves in roadside villages or towns and work for cash itinerant tinkers also serviced the villages it was difficult for the investigators to ascertain the smiths uh, baluta dues they varied by special arrangements or needs the leather worker was a balutedar in 32 villages his repair of well buckets and harness was crucial to raising irrigated crops the description could continue but the investigators found everywhere uh, but but the investigators everywhere found dues being reduced or adjusted according to economic need or pura ka pura desh gadde mein ja raha economically waise bhi individual cultivators gave more or less depending on their employment of particular balutedars the amount also reflected the yield of the harvest still the investigators could clearly see that the village looks after those balutedars whose absence would cause difficulty the others are pushed away see anand m shastri ninar the classic free market principle the classic libertarian prerequisite okay village looks after those balutedars whose absence would cause difficulty the more irreplaceable you are the more your value is in society the age old fucking principle nothing to do with any goddamn book ever written <sighs> thus even where the village <clears throat> even where the village servant system had official recognition and support okay this is in italics okay sumit guha puts this in italics so maybe it's more important thus even where the village servant system had official recognition and support it was continually restructured according to calculations of individual advantage and ultimately largely abandoned so to sum up sociologists have tended to take the frequently observed dyadic relation of service and dependence as a given as stemming from deep seated cultural traits or fundamental values in indian society implicit in this is the understanding that these are ancient institutions historians have been skeptical of this and inclined to argue that the dyadic relations observed in the early 20th century were generated comparatively recently as a consequence of the breakdown of previously extant village communities resulting from changes inaugurated by colonialism but of course a gigantic disruption but we need probe deeper and ask what explains the existence of the village servant system in the pre colonial era the genesis of a quote unquote traditional institution it is noticeable that all the scholars who have studied this problem have assumed that the village organization is its, itself a relatively unproblematic structure arising perhaps out of the functional needs of isolated rural life yet it is striking that the system was strongly developed not in the most isolated regions of 18th century maharashtra but rather in its densely settled and commercialized regions yes see 
if if common if if commies were fucking honest libertarians could have been best friends in, with them in discussing ancient history but commies are assholes see it is striking that the system theek hai what a brilliant paragraph again it is noticeable that all scholars who have studied this problem have assumed that the village organization is itself a relatively unproblematic structure arising perhaps out of the functional needs of isolated rural life gaon ke bhosri wale the isliye kar kar liye honge isliye shay traditions mein believe karte honge but then why it is striking that the system was strongly developed not in the most isolated regions of the 18th century maharashtra jahan pe sab shayad puja paath mein aur zyada vishwas karte honge it was in its densely settled and commercialized regions lol so it was a very advanced sophisticated economic system not manusmriti much indeed almost all of our evidence on its functioning comes from official efforts at its regulation and control advanced economic system bhai hum 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 arthashastra ke intellectual students and descendants hai i suggest not not really though but unknowingly i suggest that this formal and regular structuring originated in the opportunity for the securing of rents as fees or gifts or bribes and the consequent preparedness of entrepreneurial individuals to pay the whole entrepreneurial individuals balmiki capitalists preparedness of entrepreneurial individuals to pay the holders of political authority for the creation and protection of such rights creation of such rights then protection of such rights an important aspects of the aspect of the jajmani system is then merely one example of widespread phenomenon which is rent seeking and the investment of resources in creating permanent heritable sources of rents zor zor ke bol ke sabko scheme bata do it is significant that these village offices were called watan sometimes vritti both best translated as patrimony and thus seen as analogous to other property rights in venal office thus at the same time as the detailed descriptions of village servants with fixed dues in kind were being compiled in western maharashtra little trace of any such system could be found in thinly populated areas where the cash economy was undeveloped and the need for fixed services should have been all the greater wahan pe bhosri ke koi jajmani nahi kar raha hai manusmriti par ke for example chatisgarh formerly part of the state of madhya pradesh was in the early 19th century a landlocked region with limited trade When Jenkins wrote his report he remarked on the absence of watandars that is of headmen or peasants possessed of hereditary rights in this area by contrast to the maratha territories to the west the establishment of village servants was equally undeveloped okay the establishment of village servants was equally undeveloped and those who existed were mainly employed by the gauntia headmen effectively tax farmer of each village even the barber owes professional services to all the village community but is chiefly employed by the gauntia <sighs> only the smith and washerman seems to have been seem to have been um, uh, seem to have been mainly employed for the benefit of the farming community as a whole thus craftsmen and specialists were seen as dependents of the village lord exactly like tenant farmers now we are supposed to think all of this happened because brahmins planned this now if the argument is that brahmins brahmins sanctioned these things then of course we are looking at brahmins not as priests brahmins as ias babus okay then can we blame uh, ias babus in the same way as for for doing attestation and sanctioning things that are demanded in society anyway or or are babus uh, influencing society as well i don't think they are i think the society is influ- being influenced by uh, academics as was a society in some ways uh i mean um, an effort was made to influence society by brahmins but it always had econo- socio economic factors behind it which maybe were were seen by the politicians the kshatriyas and then with collaboration with the brahmins uh they said that okay let's make this a rule but among all these discussions when is a brahmin coming up the only time a brahmin was mentioned was when he was being an asshole on an individual level which in fact proves that it had nothing to do with manusmriti and when his payment goes down in a, in a society which is supposedly traditional and all about parampara anushasan etc so much of jenkins knowledge was drawn from men like vinayak rao aurangabadkar whom he employed for nearly 20 years 
Vinayak Rao spent over 3 years traveling from village to village in Wadhard and Chhattisgarh interviewing and collecting information on local geography institutions antiquities and practices the hundreds of folios of his notes deposited in the india office collection in london bear impressive witness to his industry and command of languages much of the material diye dekho bhai british education system hai ye much of the material consists of direct transcripts of interviews and answers to questions these field notes therefore give us a fine grained picture of village institutions and traditions in the early 19th century reading them we find that both baluta and jajmani had a very limited presence in this area the vinayak rao in interview thus vinayak rao interviewed bhimrai thakur and other halba landholders of panadur when touring that area they understood the term baluta and responded there are no balutadars in chatisgarh but they are found in panadur the carpenter receives three measures of grain per plow as does the smith what the barber gets is determined by each farmer individually if the local priest gond priest etc were employed that year they get a basket of grain plus two more measures it is clear and quote it is clear that the really essential functionary had established a fixed claim others including those concerned with purity the barber and the supernatural the priest had a quasi wage relationship this was in a small town in the smaller villages nearer the mountains the local covers cover chiefs uh stated flatly quote in our country the custom of balote dadi does not exist however the smith carpenter receives 10 measures of grain for each plow end quote the smith would obviously be a vital functionary in a farming economy and it would be rational to pay him by the year rather than have to bargain every time a plow share had to be replaced or a tool repaired the khatti or or khatti carpenter comes smith therefore crops up in almost every account so in kankar kanker kanker uh, div- subdivision there were no village accountants and vinayak rao noted that there were no carpenters people did their own woodwork ah uh-huh. old school village texas but the smith was present and received a basket full of grain for each plow his clients had to bring their own iron the washerman was given half or three quarter shares of uh, grain for each job okay this word is there in bengali as well uh, share mon dui mon chaul ek share chaal etc the bhumak local priest is this an ancient uh, version or the etymological father of the surname bhumik because bhumik is also a, a, a given title to some brahmins i know and i've heard it's because of the because they got land grants so they got bhumi therefore became bhumik <clears throat> so the washerman uh, all was given half or three quarter shares of grain for each job the bhumak or local priest and the barber received some dues regularly similarly when landholders in bhadak or bhadak uh, modern Ch- uh, chandrapur district of maharashtra were questioned about the costs of cultivation they reported that each plow pa- paid the smith come carpenter 10 measures unclear if this is pili or kudo measure while the local priest the village watchman and the local uh, uh, while the local priest the village watchman and the local priest okay local priest do bar likh diya galti se while the local priest and the village watchman uh received one measure each dekho bhai hamara parampara anushasan pratishthan wala manusmriti padne wala desh mein kya ho raha hai village watchman aur local priest ko same salary mil raha hai hmm yet again in batal batalpur subdivision the the village headman told him that the havaldar a functionary who helped collect the land tax received 2 rupees each month from the village fund in addition farmers might give him at pleasure up to one kudo measure of uh, grain yearly kudo is a bengali word as well it means round and big this official had been introduced by the centralizing regime of the bhosle kings and we can perhaps see his prerequisites were beginning to harden into quote unquote custom सोसाइटी बनाता है कुछ कन्वीनियंस के वजह से बाद में उसको जाके कस्टम घोषणा कर दिया जाता है इन अदर प्लेसेस इट इज एविडेंट दैट सच प्रीरिक्विजिट्स वर बिगिनिंग टू अपीयर एज अ कॉन्सिक्वेंस ऑफ द क्रिएशन ऑफ वेरियस ऑफिस अंडर भोसले रूल व्हिच वाज अकम्पनीड बाय पॉपुलेशन ग्रोथ एंड कमर्शियलाइजेशन कमर्शियलाइजेशन क्रिप्टोनाइट ऑफ कमीज एज दीज बिकेम ऑफिस ऑफ प्रॉफिट इंडिविजुअल्स वुड बिगिन टू अक्वायर एंड डिस्प्यूट दम प्रोवाइडिंग अ पोलिटिकल एंड फिजिकल रिसोर्स फॉर द रिजीम to exploit commercialization kahe hua beosa 
in the chimur division too the bigger villages had a functionary called havaldar who allocated compulsory labor between households and who would consequently have considerable powers of harassment which he turned to advantage Cons- he would consider have considerable powers of harassment which he turned to advantage so the local people reported that in some places he received a kudo of grain from each farmer though it was not an approved usage the headman's messenger and assistant held rent free land from the state but also received a measure of grain from each peasant aha kitna manusmriti so much manusmriti so much tradition oh so so much tradition such tra- such manusmriti much tradition wow state obligations fell on every office holder even the local priest or bhumak was supposed to feed government messengers if they came to the village and carry messages for the headman <laughs> oh fuck he did however protect the village from tigers and so received two measures of grain <laughs> umrad was a relatively more prosperous subdivision near nagpur much cloth was woven for export and there was an active trade in cotton grain etc the term bad uh, bada balute was known here but the functionaries listed were vasi local priest amount ineligible mahar 10 kudo measures sorcerer sorcerer bhi hai ek side mein bhai priest ek taraf hai ek sorcerer bhi hai meaning koi tantrik tantrik hoga one measure astrologer one measure local priest one measure uh, village watchman ka messenger one and a quarter measures what is going on <laughs> dekho fir se सच मनुस्मृति मच वाओ मच ट्रेडिशन महार का पेमेंट है टेन कुडो मेजर्स वासी का तो पेमेंट पता नहीं है लोकल प्रिस्ट का मगर सॉर्सर का एस्ट्रोलॉजर का लोकल प्रिस्ट का वन मेजर बाद में लिखा है और विलेज वॉचमैन का मैसेजर का है वन एंड क्वार्टर मेजर बट देर वर नो वतन दार्स और हेरिटेटरी होल्डर्स एंड नॉट इवन विलेज हेडमैन फैमिली हैड हेल्प द ऑफिस फॉर जनरेशन कुड क्लेम इट एज अ पैट्रीमोनी This is a marked contrast to the more densely settled and commercialized lands of Western Maharashtra, where saleable hereditary office was institutionalized by the 16th century, if not earlier. The reason was, I suggest, that the cash economy and competition made hereditary office a desirable acquisition. Because, boy, इतना competition है, तुमको चाहिए होगा job security. <laughs> See why our IAS babus and WBCS babus today exist. why kids today prepare for upsc or or wbcs and why kids uh, say so proudly that do you know how hard my father worked for this job that is destroying the country so the reason was i suggest that the cash economy and competition made hereditary office a desirable acquisition so you see again the 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 notion that jajmani is an ancient tradition uh, thousands of years se chal raha hai based on tradition culture customs is only observable in places where there's high amount of cash circulating in the system and fucking insanity of competition and its creation and adjudication was a source of profit to the state and its ever hungry local functionaries see kitna kitna uh, manusmriti the way in which the regulation of the baluta system could be used to fiscal advantage can be demonstrated by a few extracts from the surviving ledgers of several tax farmers from western maharashtra these span the period from about 1750 to 1825 okay the way in which the regulation of the baluta system could be used to fiscal advantage can be demonstrated by a few extracts here let's see so half a rupee fine realized uh, mahar after fine okay half a rupee for mahar uh, did not reserve the village properly one rupee uh, a leather worker if a uh, leather worker left the village of pisarve and went to amboli 22 rupees sahib mithe khan beat a mahar one rupee leather worker left the village work undone so he was made to complete it and and, and find one and a quarter rupees santu potter failed to supply the mask for mahalakshmi so find so ye potter ka uh, la- indian language mein kya translation hoga uh, kumor no so his name is probably santu kumor kumor pada yes so a, a neighborhood of only just uh, kumors competition created an exploitative system wa wow. <laughs> and also an advanced uh, economic system sophisticated economic system competition ke wajah se jahan pe kuch hai hi nahi wahan pe system bhi nahi hai i would suggest that the opportunities for such fees and fines as well as the ruling classes need for specialized services from the villages 
on a reliable basis reliable 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 basis was important in the transformation of village specialists into hereditary office holders hereditary office holders the changing social and economic conditions we reviewed earlier led to the gradual demise of the institution in the 20th century but individualized jockeying for social and economic advantage was present at all times and then that famous fucking conclusion the the sledgehammer the power packed uh bombastic conclusion okay it will be evident that i am deeply skeptical of attempts to trace socio economic institutions to fundamental values and that i have found considerable evidence to suggest that individuals systematically sought to modify and invent customs and institutions to their own perceived advantage and that the patrimonial and the later colonial state tried to derive fiscal and political advantage from these efforts so it doesn't have anything to do with birth based casteism as we know it or it has nothing to do with hinduism the varying outcomes of these ceaseless contests explains why institutions varied considerably at different times in different regions society was never static in some traditional mode and social change is not something that arrived in south asia with colonial rule or the first five year plan ye british ka bhi credit nahi hai ye congress ka bhi credit nahi hai social change hamesha hota hai because of economics oh and notes i am grateful to john rogers for several careful readings of this article indrani chatterjee also made some valuable suggestions the reports of four anonymous referees contained many useful comments and corrections the usual disclaimer holds i have translated all the citations from indian uh, sources okay but uh he he worked in rutgers so it's end of story i should rephrase that competition without an abundance of opportunities cash economy created an exasper yes i am sure yes oh my god what a paper oh by the way yeah so since it's more or less the same amount of people who are watching anyway from the beginning let me get to two or three paragraphs of this legendary book called beyond good and evil by uh, hamare frederick nietzsche and you will see the basic fundamental uh, difference in the world view of what we now the the people watching this and and more or less agreeing with me mr astrology sastra etc versus the commies and and caste strats okay check out how beautifully this uh, work begins okay the chapter is called prejudices of philosophers the will to truth okay matlab sachai satya ke taraf pahunchne ka jo ichha hai jo chaha hai wo will okay it's written in capital w the will to truth which is to tempt us to many a hazardous enterprise satya ki khoj mein ho to hum kahan ka hazardous jagah mein pahunch jate hain the famous truthfulness with capital t the famous truthfulness of which all philosophers have hitherto spoken with respect what questions has this will to truth not laid before us what strange perplexing questionable questions it is already a long story yet it seems as if it were hardly commenced is it any wonder if we at last grow distrustful lose patience and turn impatiently away what this sphinx teaches us at last to ask questions ourselves Th- that this sphinx teaches us at last to ask questions ourselves who is it really that puts questions to us here what really is this will to truth in us in fact we made a long halt at the question as to the origin of this will that that ichha of getting to satya until at last we came to an absolute standstill before a yet more fundamental question remember nietzsche's standpoint he is critiquing christian morality i allege that commies of course are descendants of christian morality but caste strats are also viewing hindu society with the lens of christian morality where nietzsche comes in and debunks that in fact we made a long halt at the question as to the origin of this will until at last we came to an absolute standstill before a yet more fundamental question we inquired about the value of this will you will is will se kya hoga granted that we want the truth why not rather untruth and uncertainty and even ignorance remember that that insane quote i i pointed out uh, the, the the day i came back with live streams after a month remember that quote that let me see if i can just find it okay it, what a brilliant quote it was it almost described uh, how hinduism was meant to be versus how some other groups are okay yeah check out this quote objection evasion joyous distrust and love of irony are signs of health 
everything absolute belongs to pathology in context with that now now check this out that is what the book basically is about hence it's called beyond these ideas of good and evil casteism tha nahi tha casteism kharab tha ya bahut badhiya tha ye sab ke beyond ek ek jagat hai to why not rather untruth and uncertainty even ignorance the problem of the value of truth presented itself before us or was it we who presented ourselves before the problem which of us is the oedipus here which the sphinx it would seem to be a rendezvous of questions and notes of interrogation and could it be believed that it at last seems to us as if the problem had never been propounded before as if we were the first to discern it get a sight of it and risk raising it for there is risk in raising it perhaps there is no greater risk now it begins this this sub chapter three small paragraphs basically okay this second paragraph begin with a paragraph begins with a small quote okay ye quote koi fixed aadmi ka nahi hai this is uh, this is he, this is sort of nietzsche trolling all uh, religious christian people okay so it's sort of a quote that they would people like them would say but when you hear the quote you will see that casteist trads would probably also agree commies will probably also would agree with these kinds of statements free market people already know this is absolute horseshit and now in different contexts we are finding out that these sorts of world views are absolutely horseshit check this out the quote how could anything originate out of the opposite for example how could truth come out of error or the will to truth out of the will to deception or the generous deed out of selfishness or the pure sun bright vision of the wise man out of covetousness such genesis is impossible whoever dreams of it is a fool nay worse than a fool things of the highest value must have a different origin an origin of their own in this transitory seductive illusory paltry world in this turmoil of delusion and cupidity they cannot have their source but rather in the lap of being being with capital b in the intransitory in the concealed god in the thing in itself there must be their source and nowhere else end quote okay before nietzsche trolls this world view see for ourselves okay let's see for ourselves see why can't truth come out of error tum galti kar kar ke to samajh sakte ho ke are bhosri ke wo satya to kuch aur tha being kami for 26 years can obviously make you a great hindutvadi why can't will to truth come out of will to deception and th- more importantly for any free market pro free market guy this is the most obvious one why can't generous deed come out of selfishness selfishly for your own interests so that your company is brilliant and gives you the best profits you run such a stable fucking company that you employ thousands of people for decades and decades okay magar aisa nahi hoga acche results ke liye bahut acche seemingly acche desires hone chahiye okay that's the bullshit world view now now nietzsche trolls this this mode of reasoning discloses the typical prejudice by which metaphysicians of all times can be recognized this mode of valuation is at the back of all their logical procedure through this quote and quote belief of theirs they exert themselves for their quote and quote knowledge for something that is in the end solemnly christened quote and quote the truth okay khud ne apna logic banaya khud ne belief banaya khud ne usko knowledge ghoshna kar diya uske baad usse jo mila bol diya ki yahi bhosri ke truth hai <laughs> the fundamental belief of metaphysicians is the belief in antithesis of values it never occurred even to the wariest of them to doubt here on the very threshold where doubt however was more was most necessary because it may be doubted firstly whether antithesis exists at all and secondly whether the popular value whether antithesis exists at all wah and secondly whether the popular valuations and antithesis of value upon which metaphysicians have set their seal are not perhaps merely superficial estimates isn't it aren't we realizing that these are fucking superficial estimates caste hai ya nahi hai hinduism kharab hai ya bura hai hinduism ke wajah se caste hua hai bahut badhiya hai ya fir hinduism ke wajah se casteism hua hai therefore hinduism ghatiya hai so for it may be doubted firstly whether antithesis exists at all and secondly whether the popular valuations and antithesis of value upon which metaphysicians have set their seal are not perhaps merely superficial estimates merely provisional perspectives aha merely provisional perspectives besides being probably made from some corner perhaps 
फ्रॉम बिलो कोट अनकोट फ्रॉग परस्पेक्टिव ओके नीचे से कोने से कोई देख रहा है हाँ हाँ ऐसा होगा शायद एज इट वर्ड टू बोरो एन एक्सप्रेशन करेंट अमंग पेंटर्स वो फ्रॉग परस्पेक्टिव इन स्पाइट ऑफ ऑल द वैल्यू विच मे बिलोंग टू द ट्रू द पॉजिटिव द अनसेल्फिश इट माइट बी पॉसिबल that a higher and more fundamental value for life generally should be assigned to pretense to the will to delusion to selfishness and cupidity it might even be possible that what constitutes the value of those good and respected things consists precisely in their being insidiously related knotted meaning k n o t t e d wo matlab bandha hua related knotted and crocheted to these evil and apparently opposed things perhaps even in being essentially identical with them perhaps but who wishes to concern himself with such dangerous perhapses for that investigation one must await the advent of a new order of philosophers okay like joker said we need a new 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 batch of new crop of philosophers such as will have other tastes and inclinations the reverse of those hitherto prevalent philosophers of the dangerous perhaps in every sense of the term and to speak in all seriousness i see such new philosophers beginning to appear i i, I hate to put this book down jab padhna shuru karta hu lagta hai ek da fir se shuru se fir se padhte rahu there are i'll just read two more paragraphs having kept a sharp eye on philosophers and having read between their lines long enough i now say to myself that the greater part of conscious thinking must be counted among the instinctive functions and it is so even in the case of philosophical thinking one has here to learn a new as one learned a new about the heredity and innateness as little as the act of birth comes into consideration in the whole process and procedure of heredity just as little is being conscious opposed to the instinctive in any decisive sense the greater part of the conscious thinking of a philosopher is secretly influenced by his instincts and forced into definite channels ah ah this is where again rene girard comes in rene girard says bhai reason vision kuch nahi hai sab hai instinct sab hai basic desire uske baad reason comes as a sort of a pr manager or lawyer to justify your actions which you had already decided and behind all logic and its seemingly sovereignty of movement there are valuations or to speak more plainly physiological demands for the maintenance of a definite mode of life for example that the certain is more worth more than the uncertain that illusion is less valuable than truth oh my god illusion is less valuable than truth such valuations in spite of their regulative importance for us might notwithstanding be only superficial valuations special kinds of uh, nyayasri such as may be necessary for the maintenance of being such as ourselves supposing in effect that man is not just the measure of things the falseness of an opinion is not for us any objection to it it is here perhaps that our new language sounds most strangely the question is how far an opinion is life furthering life preserving species preserving perhaps species rearing and we are fundamentally inclined to maintain that the falsest opinions to which the synthetic judgments a priori belong are the most indispensable to us that without a recognition of logical fictions without a comparison of reality with the purely imagined world of the absolute and immutable without a constant counterfeiting of the world by means of numbers man could not live that the renunciation of false opinions would be a renunciation of life a negation of life to recognize untruth as a condition of life that is certainly that is certainly to impugn the traditional ideas of value in a dangerous manner and a philosophy which ventures to do so has thereby alone placed itself beyond good and evil oh. बहुत सारे कमेंट्स आए अनंत के देखते हैं एनीथिंग एब्सोल्यूट इज ऑफ पैथोलॉजी यस दैट्स व्हाई कुशल इज नीड्स ओ आई सी आई सी आई एडमायर नीड्स ही इज अ पर्सन हु वेंट डाउन द रैबिट होल एंड केम अप विद एन आंसर बट द प्राइस फॉर या 
curious so do you accept objective morality or subjective morality or is there a third option yes there is a third option see there is multi value multi variant truths and stuff एग्जाम्पल के बिना हम डिस्कस नहीं कर सकते बट आई एम आई एम मेंटली टू फैटिक ऑफ सॉक्रेटिस इन माई ओपन ऑनस्ट ओपिनियन ऑल दो ही इज द फादर इंटेलेक्चुअल फादर ऑफ इवन फूको इट्स ग्रेट टू लिसन टू सच ग्रेट क्वेश्चन टू मी ऑलवेज द क्वेश्चन इज मोर इंपॉर्टेंट दैन दंसर आ स्पार्क ऑफ इंटेलेक्ट स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द एबिलिटी टू क्वेश्चन येस एंड दैट इज आर ट्रेडिशन नो ऑल आवर टेक्स्ट आर कॉन्वर्सेशन क्वेश्चन समबडी नॉट अंडरस्टैंडिंग समथिंग एंड आस्किंग the deity the god or the master himself like wo srila prabhupada's book beyond uh, no no beyond illusion and doubt wahan pe disciple prashn puch raha hai sri vigyan bhairav tantra 600 ad kashmiri shaivism ke era mein likha gaya wahan pe bhairavi is asking questions and clearing her doubts with bhairav himself dislike stoicism socrates himself did not follow his philosophy which he preached in certain times but if you create a philosophy usko khud to follow kar <laughs> but socrates was the ultimate contrary and it's natural that he con- <laughs> but it's uh, the instinct to not accept something as the final answer that i like about him yeah he hai yeah he hai well said anand not accept something as the final answer yahi to hai wo wo health the sign of health the love of irony acha oh aisa hua kitna maza kitna hilarious baat hai sab kuch mein dimag hil jana wohi hai pathology j krishna murthy another great contrarian uh, hence for me the honest philosopher was diogenes uh, he followed what he preached but what he uh, but then he was a preacher not a philosopher you are supposed to seek with no predestination and flow as your logic takes you so go that last line yes good answer you didn't fall for the black and white fallacy so many people for that fall for that the questions are more important than the answers that's the dharmic way even in gita too it's all about uh, yeah the entire gita is a conversation questions what am i supposed to do here how long is this you mean the live stream or the book you know live stream abhi end ho raha hai uh let's wait for ninar's answer and then we'll go offline ha oh, what a what a fascinating live stream it was but more importantly ponder over this contemplate over this once again why is sumit guha not in the country teaching in some private or institution or government institution or think tank why is mr sociologist not in such positions why is that let's call him secret socialist so, sociologist okay why is mr secret sociologist uh much more senior to mr sociologist is not in any indian institution book the book is not not very long see itna hai thin book magar magar slowly padhna padega uh thoda complex english to hai hi translation hai fir bhi and uh wo concepts are so so fascinating so so juicy beautiful uh gar gar matlab fluently padhne padhne se wo maza nahi aayega ek do paragraph padh ke thoda sochne mein hi maza hai how long uh the pages are 226 pages this this print at least uh okay then thank you for joining the live stream guys fascinating live stream today uh shoti prathar kono ghatona ki bengale paoa jay minakshi lekhi uh, minakshi lekhi na minakshi jain re bhai kar meche minakshi <laughs> minakshi lekhi said there is none tale raja ramon roy or sati related truth ki um what have um uh, what i've come to understand is that the main incidents of sati happened in rajasthan there were some definitely happening in bengal okay no no uh, evidence is not something i've heard of but the numbers were definitely not too many uh, people were maybe uh, trying to get into that more kyunki achanak usko wo custom ka shayad stamp lag gaya tha so in that situation uh, ramon roy was uh, used by the british government to prevent it it's not like british government had i mean were, were trying to Uh, do away with all evil customs and stuff ramon roy ko shayad groom bhi kiya ja raha tha <clears throat> there will be no political protection for folks like sumit goa yeah a, a tenure job would be a would be a uh, political protection no aap koi ja ke maar de to wo to alag baat hai brahm hatya brahmin hatya to hamari yahan bahut hi look down upon hai wo to humko prevent karna hi hai but the way his stature is 81 में कैम्ब्रिज से पीएचडी कर लिया है उसको यहाँ पे कुछ बढ़िया एडवाइजर ही बना देते विल डॉक्टर सुमित गुहा कम बैक टू इंडिया इवन इफ इज सैलरी इज एट पार आई डोंट सी व्हाई वुडंट ही बिकॉज हिज एंटायर वर्क इज अबाउट इंडिया ओनली यू डोंट नीड अ लॉट ऑफ वर्ड्स टू से प्रोफाउंड थिंग्स अनदर ओ माई गॉड यस यस 
some of the best books i have are the shortest ones that is one hilarious thing i found out after getting back my reading habit H- how i became a hindu sitaram goel's book this book the moment he says caste is a british concept goa will be driven out of the country <laughs> where they don't say profound things i apologize for implying they would then your job won't help you or prevent you from rabbit crowds to come after you are crowds kitne din aaye din aayenge ek do din bhaga denge minakshi lekhi but minakshi jain is a lekhi ka so then minakshi lekhi short form standard of living yeah you can have such a uh, western standard of living in south bombay and uh, and new delhi hyderabad bangalore okay uh, without the risk of getting shot in your campus you need a political party to protect academics to keep rabbit crowds away you need chatriya to protect brahmins mr babuna said that he won't be working in delhi because of pollution <laughs> yeah but at least he is doing india centric work because of some collaboration with i guess india or indian, gov- indian government or indians वो भी कोई अप्रोच नहीं कर रहा है सुमित गुहा को समडे डिस्कस वर्तमान भारत बाई स्वामी जी या समडे माय गॉड आई वुड नॉट लिव इन दिल्ली इवन इफ देयर वाज नो पोल्यूशन आई हैव सीन सो मेनी एकेडमिक्स हु वर ड्रिवन अवे बाय रैबिट क्राउड्स हेडेड बाय पॉलिटिशियंस या हां तो मतलब सी माय प्रीरिक्विजिट ऑफ कोर्स इज दैट दे डू प्रोटेक्ट हिम ऑफ कोर्स दे डिफेंड हिम पब्लिकली दे 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 आई मीन prevent all the physical violence and stuff they prevent they quash those protests and they make sure that they are not going to take these uh, violent measures lightly uske baad hi okay thanks for joining the live stream guys bye bye good night Samayukta Bara Bhaya Karam Swami Chandra Bhusa